ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله uh, the course outline you already have it was divided up into four basic segments the first being on aqidah because this is the foundation of the religion uh, then we were looking at tafsir because that is the uh, source of basic source of revelation we look then at hadith which is the second major source of revelation and the application of the Quran and the hadith based on correct aqidah this now produces fiqh which is the applied Islamic law so that is the order that we're following <clears throat> so uh, if there are no other if there are no questions before we start you know I will go ahead and begin with Aqidah go ahead sister what is the purpose of having an exam well the exam is to test the for yourself uh, the degree to which you are able to grasp the information it's not an obligation on you you know those of you who don't feel you want to take the exam you know don't feel that you must but it's there for you to give you an idea uh, to whatever degree exams give you that idea you know how much of the material you have actually grasped then it, it gives you that much uh, those people who do the exam uh, we will you know arrange to give them a certificate that they actually did the course and did the examination uh, and uh, this certificate of course has no educational value in the sense of academics if you want to go on to do something you know further but just for your yourself uh, this is the um, intent okay. go ahead yeah inshallah we hope to continue this is one level of a series of courses actually um, I have started the Islamic online university which began uh, basically about a month and a half ago and um, which is geared towards a more in-depth detailed academic study this is part of the course material you know you're doing it here now in this circumstance it helps to prepare it and make it easier for you to do it if you wanted to do that course which is uh, inshallah working towards something which is accredited where people can actually come out with uh, you know certificates or degrees which are um, acceptable in academia and we will be following every summer or possibly summer and winter uh, breaks uh, continual levels of this course of studies you know matching uh, the area that is covered also in the Islamic online university because after this then the next level of the course would be uh, f uh, focused on usul al aqidah then following that would be focused on usul al tafsir my book usul al tafsir would be covered in, in its entirety then uh, usul al hadith going into greater depth and also usul al fiqh and there's a, that's a vast area in and of itself and, and inshallah we would try to do uh, sirah also usul of sirah which is the biography of the Prophet Muhammad and also da'wah the usul of da'wah Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah indeed all praise is due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last messenger of Allah okay our first session begins with aqidah as I mentioned and what we'll be looking at in this session uh, is the categories of Tawheed the basic uh, areas of Tawheed which have been 
identified by scholars for the purpose of understanding uh, how Tawheed uh, should be comprehended and applied. So if we begin with the term Tawheed itself, which is a verbal noun coming from the verb Wahada Yuwahidu Tawheedan, uh, it literally means unification, to unify, to make one that which wasn't one. However, when we use it in the context of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is obviously not applicable because we do not look at Allah as being three who we made one or, you know, as divisible. So what we are referring to when we speak about uh, Tawheed with regard to Allah, Tawheedullah, what we're speaking about here is really maintaining Allah's unity in our understanding of Allah. Allah is a unity. But how do we understand? How do we relate to Him? Relate to His instructions with regards to Himself, with regards to His creatures, uh, with regards to ourselves. How do we relate to Him? We are obliged to relate to Him based on the principle of Tawheed, uh, maintaining His unity in all of those uh, interactions with Allah's commandments. So what we are talking about then is recognizing the oneness of Allah with regards to His dominion over His creation, that He has no partner in this regard and He is unique. And in regards to His names and His attributes, that these have no similitude, there's nothing similar to them. Furthermore, with regards to worship, that He is the only one deserving of our worship. Now, these aspects were divided into specific categories by scholars of the past in order to deal with deviant ideas which arose amongst the Muslim Ummah. When Islam spread from Arabia into Syria, into Egypt, into uh, Persia, where people already had a tradition of understanding a law in a way which was contrary to Islamic teachings, where they already had this tradition, they came into Islam, they brought some of these ideas with them. And they tried to re-express these ideas, but with Islamic terminologies, etc. So when these kind of ideas arose, it became necessary for scholars to combat these ideas, to respond to these ideas, and to clarify to uh, the Muslims what is the correct understanding of Allah. So uh, we found scholars dividing Tawheed into three basic categories. Some scholars divided it into two. But the most popular uh, analysis is based on three basic categories, what are known as Tawheed al-Rububiyya, which is basically maintaining the oneness of Allah's Lordship. Uh, Tawheed al-Asma wa sifat which is maintain the unity of Allah's names and attributes. And Tawheed al-Ibadah, which is maintaining the unity of Allah with regards to worship, that He alone des deserves to be worshipped. Now, these three categories, though, uh, we are going to now look at them in more detail. The reality is that they are all overlapping. They are all a part of a, com of, of a whole. Though we look at them f separately for analysis purposes, in the same way that we look at the human body, for example, uh, in the medical profession, one may look at the skeletal system, they may look at the nervous system, they may look at the, uh, the blood circulatory system, the digestive systems. People look at human beings from uh, different aspects of the systems which constitute their whole body. But these systems are all uh, interrelated. And 
when one is to if one is to understand a human being one must understand the systems as a whole in its completeness similarly when we look at the issues of Tawheed we need to keep that in mind uh, that though we may separate uh, different aspects of Tawheed for the purpose of analysis they are actually part and parcel of one complete uh, system of understanding now the first category Tawheed al rububiyyah maintaining the unity of Allah's Lordship this basically addresses the quality of Allah which we refer to as Rabb that's why the term rububiyya comes from Rabb we all know Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Rabb meaning the one who maintains, creates, maintains, sustains the system that is the Rabb, the Lord and Tawheed al rububiyya addresses this that everything is created by Allah as Allah says Allahu khaliku kulli shay wa huwa ala kulli shay'in wakil Allah created all things and is the agent on which all things depend so uh, we're talking about on one from one perspective that creation all uh, is from Allah that nothing takes place in the universe in creation which is not by his permission as the Prophet Sallallahu used to often repeat in du'as la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah this is an expression of that same concept la hawla meaning there is no movement wa la quwwata and there is no power illa billah except by Allah's will this is the basic concept uh, Prophet Sallallahu also stressed it uh, in another hadith well known hadith in which he said be aware that if the whole world world gathered together in order to do something to help you they would not be able to do anything for you which Allah had not already written for you likewise if the whole of the world gathered together to try to harm you they would not be able to harm you except by something which Allah had already written would harm you so this is the basic uh, concept that nothing takes place without Allah's permission now what is included in that is the concept of good and evil in the world and this is where uh, we have an, uh, an area of understanding which is very important where people have deviated gone astray uh, misunderstood uh, purposes of creation over the issue of evil within Allah's creation you know as commonly expressed by atheists uh, to people who believe in God if God is all-powerful and God is good then where did the evil come from this is the question the fact that there is evil that to them means there can't possibly be a God that becomes a line of argument a common line of argument used by the atheists so very important for us to understand how do we deal with that type of uh, that type of concept you know where does the evil come from because we said Allah created everything it means that the evil ultimately is from Allah and we, we don't need to shy away from it those people who had difficulty in dealing with this concept you had the, the Zoroastrians the, what they refer to as the fire worshippers of, of Iran uh, what they did in their inability to grasp this concept that evil could come from a good God they attributed evil to another God so they had instead two gods Ahura Mazda who was the God of good and Angra Manu who was the God of evil right? although in their system the God of good is going to win out in the end and he is symbolized by the fire the eternal fire and the God of evil is darkness right? so the light will win over the darkness so he the God of good is the ultimate God but still they, they did not want to attribute evil to God so they had to really in what they're doing is they've elevated Satan to the level of a God who is able to create evil without Allah's permission 
And this is error. This is error. What do we, how do we understand this then? Where did the evil come from? We say yes, the evil came from Allah. But the reality is that Allah did not create anything which is purely evil. That whatever we perceive as evil in Allah's creation, there is a good side to it that we are able to see eventually or we may never see until after Yawm al you know, We don't necessarily have to see the good side to recognize that there is a good side. And that when Allah created things in which there is evil, He didn't create them for the evil, but for the good which would come from the evil. These are two important concepts for us to grasp in terms of the creation of evil. And Allah, when you, when you look in the Quran or in the Sunnah, you will not find that Allah attributes evil directly to Himself. When He speaks about the creation of evil, He will talk about the evil of His creation. As in Surah Al-Falaq, where He says, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقِ Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn from the evil that he has that min shari ma khalaf from the evil from what he has created from the evil of what he has created he didn't say from his evil but from the evil of what he has created and this is the correct uh, we could say etiquette in dealing with Allah with relationship to evil we don't focus that Allah created the evil the evil in your life is from God and no no Yes, it is a part of Allah's creation, but there is a good element to it. We focus on the good as opposed to the evil element. This is the correct uh, way of looking at it. And I should just mention that in the course of my presentation, I will mention certain verses from the Quran, etc. That uh, I know in some um, circles, it is common to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, before quoting. But actually, this is not from the Sunnah. Prophet Muhammad you will find many hadiths in which he talks about something, he brings a verse from the Quran, he doesn't say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim, he doesn't say, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, because that is only when you are reading Quran. When you sit down to read the Quran, you say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. And if you are beginning at a surah which begins with Bismillah, then you can say, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. But it is not a requirement in the course of a conversation or a presentation, etc. You're mentioning a piece of a verse or a verse that you must go through that. Right? So just to clarify in case some of you might be wondering, well, why isn't he saying, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem? Okay? So, what we're talking about here then is that Allah, in creating certain things in this world in which uh, there is evil, we can see evil in it. The intent behind that creation is not for that evil, but from the good which would come from the evil. And we, in our personal lives, function using the same principle. In that, one will go to a doctor, uh, because you're going to travel someplace, and they tell you this is an area where there are certain diseases, so you should get, you know, vaccination, and you allow that doctor to stick a needle in your arm right we could say as a if we looked at the, the the sticking of a needle in your arm by itself we say this is evil if somebody came up to you and said listen can i stick this needle in your arm you say no <laughs> no, no thank you right i'm not a masochist i don't love pain you know so i'm not going to you know encourage people to go sticking needles in me right but if in sticking that needle, whether it's through acupuncture or it's through vaccination, there is good which comes out of it, then I will subject myself. So you'll see people, you know, doing acupuncture, you see they have needles all over their heads and their backs and their arms and, you know, and you look at this and say, wow, you know, something, normally you would not welcome this. But because of the fact that it has been shown to produce, you know, relief from certain pains and things like this, people subject themselves to it. So they're doing this for the good which comes from it, not from the evil which is directly involved in that, attaining that good. Similarly, people question, if Allah knew 
before he created Adam and Iblis that Iblis would refuse to bow to, to Adam that Adam would eat from the tree because of Iblis's uh, trickery so why did he create Iblis? Huh? he could have created Adam left Iblis out of the picture and we just have things are in order no problems no so why? The point is that when Allah created uh, Iblis, the evil which came from Iblis, it produced a great good. If we look at Iblis and Adam, both of them disobeyed Allah. Adam disobeyed Allah and ate from the tree. Iblis disobeyed Allah and didn't bow in honor before Adam. Some people mistakenly understood or understand that Iblis's refusal to bow is what made him a kafir. But this is not true. This is not true. Because if in Iblis's act of disobedience is kufr, what do we say of Adam? Did he not disobey also? So you'd have to say Adam became a kafir also. No. Disobedience in and of itself does not cause a person to become a disbeliever. The Khawarij, the group which broke away from the early body of Islam, that was the position they took. If you made any act of disobedience, you became a disbeliever. Finish. This is a, this is a deviation. This is an aberration. This is not the correct Islamic understanding. Sin does not make a person a disbeliever. The point is that when Adam disobeyed Allah and Allah had taught him words of repentance, he turned back to Allah in repentance. In the case of Iblis, when he disobeyed Allah and Allah called him upon it, what did he do? Did he turn to Allah in repentance? No. He said, I am better than him. I'm better than Adam. You made me from fire and you made him from clay. This is where the disbelief came. Because what in fact he was saying was that it was not befitting for me to bow before Adam because I am superior to him. And the fact that you are telling me to bow before him Im indicates that you are wrong. Because his disbelief, he's saying, Allah, God, you are wrong in telling me to bow before this who that is inferior to me it should be bowing before me this is where now the disbelief comes into play he is attributing to Allah error this is a statement of disbelief anybody who says Allah made a mistake here that's a statement of disbelief this is where the disbelief came so the point is though Adam disbelieved, uh, disobeyed Allah, Iblis disobeyed Allah, fell into disbelief. He came and he tricked Adam into disobeying Allah. And when he did so, Adam turned back to Allah in repentance. The turning back to Allah in repentance is one of the greatest acts of worship. Isn't it? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said what? Kullu bani Adam khatta. All of Adam's descendants constantly commit errors. Wa khayr al khatta'in at tawabun. And the best of those who constantly err are those who constantly turn back to Allah in repentance. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was also quoted in Sahih Muslim as saying, if you didn't commit sins, and turn back to Allah in repentance. Allah would have removed you from the face of the earth. Brought another people who would commit sins. And turn back to Allah in repentance. And he would forgive them. So the act of turning to Allah in repentance. This is a great act of worship. So much so that Prophet Muhammad said. At ta'ibu min dhambi kaman la dhambala. One who repents from sin is like one without sin. This is how great. 
Furthermore, when Adam turned to Allah in repentance, then Allah forgave him. This manifestation of Allah's attribute of forgiveness, this great mercy, this came about because of Adam's disobedience and turning back to Allah in repentance. So all of this great good, because of course, to receive Allah's forgiveness and His mercy and His blessings, this is a great, great uh, benefit. So that great benefit, that great act of worship, this took place because of Iblis's trickery. So the creation of Iblis was not for the trick, but for the good which came from his trick. Is that clear? Right? So, when we look at the concept of good and evil in the world, we recognize that good, everything that Allah creates ultimately is good. That the evil that we perceive in the world is not pure evil. If there is relative pure evil, it is that which comes from human beings and the jinn. Where a human being intends evil and he or she tries to implement that evil. This we can call relatively pure evil. Allah's intent is good. The act that we may see or the incident we may see may appear to us to be evil. But there is good behind it. Sometimes the good becomes very evident to us. Something happens to us and we say, oh wow, you know, why did that happen so and so? And then a day later, a few days later, we say, oh, we can see the good. That was really for this positive good thing. And other times it happens and we don't see the good. Time passes, we never see it. And this is what is in the lesson of Musa and Khidr. The lesson of Musa and Khidr in Surah Al-Kahf, this is what is in that story. Now some people mistakenly have taken from the story of Musa and Khidr that what we should learn from that is that we should follow our sheikhs, our peers, our spiritual guides and leaders without question. This is what, they have an element that tries to promote this understanding. That's how we should be with our peer, our sheikh. Right? And the example that they give commonly is that the murid or the follower should be with his sheikh like the dead body in the hands of those who are washing the body. You know? The dead body it has no will. The people washing the body turn it, they wash this side, they turn the other side, they wash it. That we should be with our sheikh like the dead body in the hands of those who are washing the body. But this is a mistaken understanding. Because neither is our sheikh or our peer or whatever equivalent to Khidr. Khidr who was receiving revelation from Allah. Nor are we equivalent to Prophet Musa, a prophet of Allah. So that analogy is totally irrelevant, is totally in error. That's the wrong analysis from it. The correct analysis is that behind calamities is good. The breaking of the boat, of course, when Khidr broke the boat, the boat started to sink. The owner of the boat would have said, why? Khidr, why did you do this? Just like Musa said, why did you do this? You know, he would have felt very bad, his boat is broken. But then, the king came down the river and was snatching everybody's boat, didn't take his boat because it was damaged. He said, ah, alhamdulillah, mashallah. He could see the end results right away, shortly thereafter. The other example of killing of the boy. Right? Relative to the parents of that boy, their child was murdered. Huh? Khidr murdered the boy. That's what they could see. They could see their child was murdered. Of course, Khidr informed us, informed Musa, and informed us that 
based on revelation from Allah, he knew, that, and based on Allah's instructions, he knew that that boy was going to grow up, his parents were righteous, and that boy was going to grow up and be a fitna for the parents to such a degree that they would have themselves fallen into kufr. So to protect them from the evil of the boy, which wasn't as evident at the time, he was only 10 or 12 years old, I mean, what was to come, you couldn't see it. He was just an innocent child. Allah took his life. Now for the parents, of course, Allah gave them another child, a girl. And this girl was righteous. And of course they would have appreciated their daughter. But they would have remained in their hearts until they died a sadness for the loss of their son. Isn't it? Their murdered son. They would still feel that loss. But of course on the day of judgment, when Allah judges things and explains to them, then they will realize that that loss, that which they thought was a loss, was a gain. You see? And that's the difference between the two. That is, comes out of that story. The story of Musa and Khidr. That there are certain things which will happen in our lives. We may have difficulty in understanding what is the rhyme and the reason behind these things. We can't see any. So the tendency for us is to say this is bad. And you know, why Allah, why did you do this? We start to question Allah. And this is, if you listen to the atheists, the leading atheists, people like Hawkins, right, Jay Hawkins, you know, the leading physicist who was all-time atheists, written books on time and how the world has no beginning, etc. If you listen to him, in the midst of all his atheist claims and statements, you will hear this little voice crying out, saying, Why am I like this? Because he is a quadriplegic, in a wheelchair, twisted, he can't even hardly speak, and this happened to him in his 20s. He was fine. He grew up a young person. Then he had this debilitating disease which reduced him to a cripple being pushed around in a wheelchair. He has this massive brain, but physically he is in the worst of shape. So in what he, you hear the crying out from him is, God, why did you do this to me? If there is a God, there, there, there is no reason for this to have been done to me. This is unfair. There are so many other people in the world. He visited India. He saw all these, a billion Indians there. The vast majority of them are not contributing what he is contributing. As far as he sees it. But they're healthy. And here is he with all this knowledge and he's benefiting humankind. And he's in this shape. Why? Why me? There can't possibly be a God. Because of his inability to deal with tragedy. Calamity. He cannot understand the good behind it. So therefore he ends up denying God's existence. And this is common. If you listen to most of the people who disbelieve, who did that, deny God's existence, usually you'll hear this in their statements. I had a and when I was eight years old, you know, she was such a nice aunt. She was so kind to us. Then she had a car accident and died. Why? What did she do to deserve that? You see, from that comes disbelief in God. So, the principle of rububiyah, understanding the creation, the creation of everything which exists, this gives us the foundation for understanding tragedy in life. To be able to recognize that there is good behind it all, even though we may not be able to perceive it. So, this, out of this comes obviously uh, trust in God. You know, once one has that knowledge to realize that behind all of these things is good, then we are able to put our trust in God. Whatever happens in our lives, we realize that He is the one who controls it all and it is ultimately for our benefit. The other point which comes out of recognizing Allah's dominion over all things, that He is the creator and sustainer of everything, 
is that there is no room in this understanding of Allah for amulets and charms and omens and all these other things connected that people commonly depend on to protect them from evil and to bring good to them right and this includes all of the arms the charms and amulets whether a person uses a stone or a flower or four-leaf clover or a rabbit's foot or whatever they use or they use the Quran where they produce a Quran which is one inch by one inch you know not intended for reading because you must have a microscope to be able to read what is written on the pages so they didn't intend reading but so that it will be put in a locket worn around your neck hung in your car you know or whatever in order to bring baraka to protect you from evil this is also in the category of amulets and charms and the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk and he stated that on a circumstance where he was giving taking the oath of allegiance from a group of uh, the companions and he took it from a from everybody except one individual and so they asked him why didn't you take the oath from this individual he said because he's wearing a charm at that point he went inside of his cloak took it out tore it and threw it then he took the oath of allegiance from him and he said whoever wears an amulet has committed shirk so this is a general statement which covers all forms of amulets so basically when we speak of Tawheed of Rububiyya we're talking about Allah's dominion over all things nothing takes place in the creation except by his permission whatever we perceive as being evil there is good behind it it is a part and parcel of Allah's creation and because of the fact that he has dominion over all things then to depend on anything besides him to protect us from evil or to bring good we are in fact destroying this principle of Tawheed al rububiyyah now the second category Tawheed al asma wa sifat or maintaining the unity of Allah's names and attributes this category may be understood from five perspectives the first one is understanding Allah's names, his names and his attributes according to how Allah and his messenger have described him first and foremost our understanding of God is based on revelation Allah revealed himself to us through revelation in order that we would have the correct concept of who he is if we rely on our brains our minds to understand God then we end up like the Hindus with so many different idols etc you know or the Buddhists believing that our spirits become gods when you reached the highest level of spiritual journey you know or the variety of other systems that are out there where Allah is in one way or another perceived through his creation so in order to protect us from falling into that misunderstanding Allah revealed descriptions of himself in revelation coming in the scriptures as well as in the explanations of the prophets and this is the basis by which we understand Allah first and foremost as Allah and his messenger have described him secondly we maintain that position without adding any new names and attributes to Allah which have not been mentioned by himself which though may be found in some of the things which he did but he didn't take these uh, terms 
as names for himself. For example, the name Rashid or Nasir. You have people called Abdul Rashid and Abdul Nasir. Jamal Abdul Nasir, obviously, the ruler of, former ruler of Egypt. Now, Allah does not describe himself in the Sunnah as an Nasir or Ar Rashid. So, so as on the basis of that, it is incorrect to describe Allah in that way. Though the meanings are not bad, but because of the fact that Allah did not use these terms, we do not do it. And this is in keeping with the principle of avoiding innovation in the religion. Now, there are some uh, lists of Allah's names and attributes which can be found in Qurans printed in Pakistan in the back page. You'll find 99 names. None of these lists are authentic. None of the lists are authentic. There are weak hadiths found in Sunan Abi Dawood and a Tirmidhi, but they are not authentic. So those lists are not authentic in and of themselves. What one needs to do is to see uh, any of the books which are written on the names and attributes of Allah where they present authentic narrations or hadiths to confirm or verse from the Quran to confirm each and every name that is the correct way to approach it thirdly when we describe Allah we do so without giving him the attributes of his creation that is where Allah describes himself in, in one way uh, we do not attribute to him things which would make him like his creation. Uh, for example, we find in the Torah, believed in by the, both the Christians and the Jews, in Genesis 2 verse 2, where it states there, And on the seventh day God finished his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done resting he got tired after working for six days he got tired needed a day of rest so we had that day of rest for God the Sabbath right? this concept is unacceptable Islamically Allah in fact does not tire from his work that he doesn't become tired he doesn't sleep as Allah describes himself in Ayatul Kursi لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم Neither tiredness nor sleep overcomes him. This is the correct description of Allah. Also, you can find in Exodus uh, 32 verse 14 where it is stated And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. The Jews have written this in their Torah that Allah repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people this is nonsense the idea of attributing to Allah repentance who was he repenting to? to the Jews you know he felt sorry he apologized to the Jews for the see this is what they have turned Allah into in there if you read the Old Testament Allah is turned into the genie from the magic lamp. You know, Aladdin, he rubs the lamp, the genie pops up, and he tells the genie, do this, do that, do the other. So this is how they treat Allah. You can see in their writings where God is the personal uh, servant of the Jewish people. Right? So this is, of course, as I said, a clear error to attribute this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can also add to this the claim that Allah has a spirit and this is something we'll look at in more detail later but the idea that Allah has a spirit right and that the spirit inside of each and every one of us is a piece of Allah's spirit this is also a deviation in understanding uh, Allah's names and attributes. 
The basic principle that we follow here is لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There is nothing at all like him and he is the hearer and knower of all. This is the basic principle. We do not describe Allah in terms of his creation. Where Allah describes himself uh, in terms of using terms which we normally attribute to ourselves, Allah describes himself as having hands, a face, these type of terms. We accept them as Allah stated them, but we do not understand them in terms of his creation. That if Allah said he, he has hands, we don't say Allah doesn't have hands. No, it's just wrong. If Allah says he has hands, who are we to come along and say Allah doesn't have hands? But what we say is that his hands are not like our hands. When we think of hands, we think of these five fingers. These we don't apply this to Allah. This is error. Right? And even in English, we talk about the hands of the clock. When we see that, we don't think about a hand with five fingers moving around the dial. No. Right? So, even in English, we use these terms and we don't take them as they refer back to ourselves. We talk about the face of the mountain. Huh? We're not thinking of the mountain having a nose, eyes, and you know, no, again, you know, the face. Of, these are terms which are used, but we don't take it in its uh, literal meaning as it relates and pertains to us. But to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is as nothing in His creation. We don't imagine Allah in any way uh, within His creation. Because some people ask you, people who are into idol worship they say okay if you don't worship Allah in a form I mean how can you possibly worship Allah they're so used to the idea if you're going to worship Allah either he's Jesus on a cross or he's Shiva or he's you know Vishnu or one of the forms that they have prescribed for God that makes sense to them they can focus on this form they can worship God through the form how do you Muslims worship God without a form well, we worship God through his attributes we don't have to put a picture and an image to it because once you put an image or a picture then you have made him like his creation we say okay no he's, he's a spirit so what does a spirit look like this smoky type of hey you're talking about smoke you know whatever you whatever image you try to put on Allah it will be from something you saw you have to perceive you cannot talk about things you cannot perceive of things except that your senses have perceived them so whenever we try to picture Allah we will picture him in terms of his creation one way or another so we worship Allah without giving him any of the likenesses of his creation fourthly when we worship Allah through the Tawheed al Asma wa Sifat, we do so insisting that we do not give human beings Allah's names and attributes. As we don't give Allah human attributes or the attributes of His creation, we also should not give the creation the attributes of Allah, which is what has happened in certain groups you can find it in the Old Testament New Testament where they speak of Melchizedek Melchizedek is described as being without father or mother or genealogy he has neither beginning of days nor end of life this is one without beginning or end this is Allah so we cannot give these descriptions to human beings and this is the area within which or through which Shiites deviated from mainstream Islam. I know some people think it's because they believe in muta, temporary marriage, or other things that they have in their system that they have made permissible, which the main body of Muslims do not allow. But this is not really the area of difference. The area of difference with Shiism is this area that they have given 
to their Imams. It's all about the Imams. That's why for them belief in the Imams is one of the pillars of faith for them. As we have Arkanul Iman, we have the six pillars of faith. For them belief in the Imams is one of their pillars of faith. What does belief in the Imam mean? It means that they believe that the Imams, these 12 individuals, not including Khomeini, they talk about Imam Khomeini, they don't mean this. They mean Ali, Hassan, Hussein, this is two sons, and from Hussein, another nine descendants who they call together the 12 Imams. Now, what are the qualities of the 12 Imams? First, among those which are the qualities belonging to Allah, is that they are absolutely infallible. They cannot commit error. Not even error of thought. Not even to think wrong. A mistake. Accidentally, deliberately, inwardly, outwardly, no way. No, some people... You may, if you mention this to Shiites, they may say, no, 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 we don't believe that. No, no, we don't believe that. Well, there is a book called The Faith of Shia Islam. And it's not one book, but there are many books like this. Rid written by Muhammad Rida Al-Muzaffar, one of their scholars. In which he states there on page 35, on page 32, we believe that an imam must be infallible that is to say incapable of making errors or doing wrong either inwardly or outwardly from his birth to his death either intentionally or unintentionally what does that mean we say that is a law incapable of error Otherwise, as the Prophet ﷺ said, all of Adam's descendants commit errors, including the Imams, including the Prophets. So, this is the beginning of their deviation. Secondly, they claim that the Imams have absolute knowledge. They have knowledge of everything. Everything that was and would be, past, present, future, and they, this knowledge is intrinsic to them. We say that is Allah. Only Allah has knowledge of all things. And again, you will find Shiites will say, no, 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 we don't believe this. But when we go to the faith of Shia Islam, as well as the book called Islam, put together in Tehran by a group of Muslim brothers, edited by Saeed Akhtar Rizvi. We find there Muzaffir saying in the same book, same pages We maintain that the powers of the Imams to receive inspiration has reached the highest degree of excellence and we say that it is a divinely given power Well, however you say they got it think about what it says By this means the Imam is able to understand information about anything Anywhere and at any time. What does that mean? Knowledge about anything, anywhere, at any time. And of course, you will find uh, in their main book of hadith, equivalent to our Bukhari, Al-Kafi, chapters which headed the Imams, know when they're going to die, where they're going to die, all this kind of information. The third major point is what they refer to as Al Wilaya at Taqwiniya or Al Khilafa at Taqwiniya. We call it the creational caliphate. What this refers to? What does this refer to? As Imam Khomeini said in his book called al hukum al Islamiya on page 52, certainly the Imam has a dignified station, a lofty rank, a creational caliphate, 
and sovereignty and mastery over all atoms of creation. Sovereignty and mastery over all atoms of creation. This is the statement. This is in their books. And this is by, it's not obscure books by obscure, because of course, you can pick up, if you talk about mainstream Islam, you can find some obscure books with all kinds of nonsense in there, right? And they say, well, we don't really believe this. This is some obscure individual. We're talking about Imam Khomeini, the leader recognized by the main body of Shiites of the world, the Ithna Ashriyas of Iran and Iraq, as being their modern leader, source of knowledge, you know, Ayatollah, right? So, that's their belief. And this is where they have deviated. Right? This is what Christians did with Jesus. When they, want to, they attributed the miracles which were done by Allah at, the, at Jesus' hand, they made them the miracles of Jesus. They elevated Jesus to the status of Allah. And of course, when you try to point this out to him, them, they're saying, no, we're not elevating Jesus, a man, to the status of Allah. We're saying, no, Jesus was Allah. Yeah. They have developed a whole philosophy to explain how it is that Jesus, a man, was in fact God. And when we question them, then who was he according to your text? Who was he praying to when he was on the cross? They say, well, he was only saying those things to show the people how to pray. They're running away. They don't want to deal with the obvious statements there that is there because they know if they say yes, he was praying to God, then hey, means he's not God. Because either that or you're saying that he was praying to himself, which implies problems. You know, people who talk to themselves, you know, we know what we do with those people, right? So, to imply that, they don't want to get into that implication. They say, no, he was just doing that to show the people how to pray. But the implications are quite obvious. The fifth principle is that whenever we use the names of Allah in the context of human beings we do not use them in their definite form that is saying the the most merciful we can say and refer to a person as being merciful Rahim but we don't call them Ar Rahim which means the most merciful if we're going to use that definite form Ar-Rahim we must put before it Abd meaning the slave worshipper of Ar-Rahim or Ama female slave worshipper Amatul Rahim Amatul Rahman Amatullah these kinds we must use these terms and at the same time that we must do that we're not allowed to put the name Abd before Allah's creation Abdul Nabi which is a popular title in places like Egypt and amongst the uh, Shiites they like Abdul Rasul and this has entered amongst Sunni Muslims also one of the uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan his name was Abdul Rasul Ghulam Rasul this is also a forbidden name Ghulam Rasul means Abdul Rasul because Ghulam means Abd so it's not a permissible name Ghulam Rasul it's a very popular name Ghulam Muhammad He's like Abd Muhammad Not allowed We have to be very careful In the choosing of names Now That covers basically The names and attributes Of Allah And how we maintain Allah's unity in their regard The last category Is that of Tawheed al-Ibadah that is maintaining the unity of Allah with regards to worshipping Him. And that is the consequence of, of Tawheed al-Ibadah 
uh, sorry tawhid al rububiya and tawhid al asma sifat because if allah is the one in control of everything his attributes are unique he is the only one who can answer our prayers etc then why should we call on or worship anyone besides him that doesn't make sense common sense tells us that if he has these attributes then he is the one that we should pray to and that's what tawhid al rububiya is about that we only worship allah we do not pray to anyone besides allah and praying to anyone in islam it involves calling on anyone who cannot answer your call because somebody might say when i call on the prophet sallallahu alaihi as nuh amim keller proposes in his book his translation of the reliance of the traveler please be aware of this book reliance of the traveler which is a popular book which has been distributed all over the english speaking muslim world the first part of the book involves basically a translation of a shafi'i fiqh handbook no problem in general however in the appendix he has another story going in the appendix he promotes the idea of calling on the messenger of allah in prayer that you can call on him in prayer and they're saying well this is not the worship of the prophet this is just calling on him in prayer no no if you call on anyone who cannot answer your call you are worshiping him what i mean is we call on each other to get help you know i need to start my car come and give me a hand please no problem this is not considered to be worship you're calling on somebody who can come to your aid although the higher level is not to call on anyone prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said if you can guarantee me you will not ask anyone for anything i will guarantee you paradise this is a hadith narrated by abu dhar al ghifari if you can guarantee that you will not ask anyone for anything the prophet sallallahu said i will guarantee you paradise and abu dhar said when the prophet sallallahu said that i never asked anyone for anything and that's what he was known for he would not ask anyone for anything but this is not something required of everybody this was just this is the higher level back to the rest of us we ask people to help us in this and that and the other these people who can help us no problem but now if we call on somebody who isn't here right they're living right you have groups that promote this you can call on the sheikh right you have a problem you need his help just call on him he's a living sheikh the fact that you call on him he's not present he's not available to help you that's worship if he's dead it's also worship so whether you call on abdul qadir al jilani who is popular in the indian subcontinent and elsewhere we given the title ghawsi azam right al ghawf al azam meaning the greatest source of help right whether you do that and he's dead or you call on sheikh uh nazim you know because you are from the naqshbandi order and sheikh nazim is the man so you call on him when you are in need he is a living he's a living person but he's not here this is worship and when you call on rasulullah sallallahu again you have a line of argument that people try to raise but he's living he's living 
Prophet Sallallahu said that when the prophets die, the earth doesn't eat their body. Okay. Because the earth doesn't eat their body, does it mean they're living? Or this is just a miracle from Allah? Point number one. Point number two, if Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not dead, then the Sahaba committed a grave crime by burying a man alive. Isn't it? If he wasn't dead, then what did they do in burying him? This is nonsense. This is error. Clear error. The point is that Rasulullah is dead. And this, we know this happened when he first died. Omar came in and he was upset. People were saying that he was dead. And he threatened people. He stood up there with his sword and said, Anybody who says that the Prophet Sallallahu is dead, you're going to lose your head. People backed off. Abu Bakr came, he went in, checked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi lifted up the garment, saw he was dead, kissed his forehead, put it back, and came outside, pushed Omar aside. He said, whoever was worshipping Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam know that Muhammad is dead. But whoever was worshipping the Lord of Muhammad, then know that the Lord of Muhammad is ever living. Right? So, the point is that to call on anyone who cannot answer your prayers is worship. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Addua huwa al ibada. Calling, Addua, to make dua, to call on, from da'a, da'wa means to call. It is worship in its essence. That is the essence of worship, calling. We say, Ya Allah. If you say, Ya Rasulullah, you're involved in worshipping the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why in the masjids where you see people like to put up these plates, ornate plates, it says, Ya Allah, Ya Rasulullah, this is wrong. It's wrong. Now some people say, well, don't we say in our tashahud, Assalamu alayka ayyuhar rasul. Don't we say this? Peace be on you, O oh Messenger. Don't we say this? This is not in our tashahud. Yes, it is in the one that the Prophet taught us. But Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in Sahih al Bukhari, he informed. That when the Prophet ﷺ was living among them, they used to say that. But when he died, instead they said, "Assalam ala Nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh." Peace be on the Messenger and Allah's mercy and blessings. They didn't say "Alaika" anymore, "Ayyuhar Rasul" or "Ayyuhar Nabi." They said, As-salam ala nabi Now scholars have differed as to whether you should follow what Abd uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said or whether we should just go with what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi initially taught. The proper methodology is to go with what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said. Why? Because he said, we used to, not just I, I used to, that may be a personal thing on his part, but he said, we the companions of the Prophet Muhammad and there are a number of other narrations of other companions saying the same thing. So, if we now are going to understand what Prophet Muhammad taught us, do we understand it as our own minds tells us, or do we understand it the way that the, mess the companions of the Prophet understood it? This is the crux of the matter. Our understanding of Islam should depend on how the companions of the Prophet Muhammad understood Islam. Otherwise, you will end up with all kinds of interpretations. The Qadianis, they say, 
We follow Quran and Sunnah. In fact, in Pakistan, where everybody else uh, pray with their hands, for example, below their navel, they don't raise their hands in general when making, going from, you know, uh, going into Rukur, coming out of Rukur, all these other takbirs, they don't, raising of the hands, they don't do it. The people who do it are the Qadianis. Right? Because it's in Sahih Bukhari. It's in Sahih Muslim. You know? So in terms of following the Sunnah in that respect, they are doing it more closely than the majority of Indian and Pakistanis. However, however, in a more crucial area, where Allah says in the Quran, describing Prophet Muhammad as not being the father of any of your men, but Khatam al Nabiyin, but the seal of the prophethood. What do they do with this? When they believe in Mirza Ghulam Ahmed as a prophet having coming after Rasulullah. What do they do with this verse? They say, well, if you go to the Arabic dictionary and you look up the word khatam, you find that the word khatam not only means seal, it also means ring. It also means a ring. So they say, as the ring, when you put it on your finger, it beautifies your hand. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was the beautification of the prophethood and not the seal. You see? They have gone in and made their interpretation to suit their set of beliefs concerning Ghulam Ahmed. So, what is our response? Yes, the Arabic dictionary will tell you this. However, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they didn't understand it that way. When Allah said, Khatam and Nabiyyin, they understood it meant the seal of the prophethood. Finish. And they narrated other statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, La Nabiyya Ba'di. There is no messenger coming or prophet coming after me. That's the understanding. And that is the correct understanding. So this is why we find uh, those stressing, those who stress the importance of understanding the Quran and the Sunnah according to the interpretation or the understanding of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, those who came after them, and the Tabi'at Tabi'een and those who came after them, about whom Rasulullah said, Khairun Nasi Qarni, the best of people are my generation. Thumma alladheena yalunahum, then those who followed them, thumma alladheena yalunahum, then those who followed them. Those first three generations, the best of generations, they are referred to by the Arabic term as salaf as salih, the righteous predecessors. So when a person says, I am a salafi, I follow the way of the Salaf. They are saying, I understand the Quran and the Sunnah as it was understood by the Sahaba and those early generations. That is what Salafiyah means. It doesn't mean a group. You know, because you may have a group which says, we are the Salafis. But they may be doing things which are not in accordance with the way of the Sahaba and the early generation. They may be saying things which is not in accordance. So though they may claim for themselves, we are the Salafs, Salafis, they are not. Or they are in error. We don't attribute whatever they say and whatever they do to the Salaf. Unless what they have done is, it, is, is based really in the practice of the early generation, then we can say yes, that is the way of the Salaf. The way of the companions of the, the Prophet Muhammad that way about which Prophet Muhammad said, my nation will divide up into 73 different sects. 72 in hell and one in paradise. And when the companions asked the Prophet what is that one? 
He said, the one that I am on and you are on. مَا أَنَا عَلَيْهِ وَأَصْحَابِي The one which I am following and my companions follow. So this is the correct understanding. So when we come back to Tawheed al-Ibadah, worshipping Allah, by maintaining His unity in that worship, we do so in the way that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad did. We do not invent or introduce new ways of worship. As some people, for example, they want to celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad So they say, well, you know, this is something good. They may even bring a verse from the Quran. They would say, Allah said in the Quran, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. They bring this verse out. And you say, well, what does it say? Celebrate the Prophet's birthday there. It's just there, it's there. This is what it means. It's their interpretation. Right? Their interpretation. The point is, that the companions of the Prophet Muhammad didn't understand that verse that way. And that's why they never celebrated his birthday. And he himself didn't understand that verse that way. And he didn't celebrate his birthday. And the early generations didn't celebrate his birthday. It wasn't until some 400 years after the time of Prophet Muhammad that his birthday began to be celebrated in Egypt in the Fatimid Shiite rule. In the Fatimid Shiite dynasty in Egypt, the celebration of the Prophet's birthday began. So we say this is not legitimate. Some people say, well, okay, leave that aside. Just the idea of celebrating his birthday, what are we doing in the celebration? We're only remembering Rasulullah, we're asking Allah to bless him. You know, these are all good things. We remember his sirah, his life, and all this. These are all good things. Do you say this is not good in Islam? Yes, these things are good things. But to combine them on that day, every year you have now created something new in the religion. This is bidah. Similarly, we could ask, if somebody suggested to you you, see, you have to understand bid'ah sometimes it involves something completely new like the idea of the birthday celebration because we don't really have any precedence for it at all in Islam but bid'ah may actually have precedence in the religion itself wherein a person takes something like after prayers raising your hand in dua after every prayer people raise their hands in dua people say what's wrong with that? What's wrong with it? Prophet Muhammad said that Allah does not like or he is shy that anyone would raise their hands in dua and that they would put their hands down without fulfilling their wish, their desire. Isn't that imply that we should raise our hands in dua? Prophet Muhammad raised his hands in the dua of istisqa the prayer to seek rain. He raised his hand so high, that's how he did it, you could, they could see his armpits. Say, so here's the evidence. But the point is, we do not find any narration indicating that the Prophet Muhammad after every prayer, raised his hands in dua. People say, this is picky. Why are you going to get so picky? You know? If it said that you raise your hands, Allah is shy not to give you. He said the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands in istisqa. Why can't we just do it after every prayer then? What's the problem here? We say, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is not just what he did, but also what he didn't do. You have sunnah fi'liyah, the sunnah of actions which he did, and sunnah tarkiyah, or sunnah of actions which he didn't do, which are religion, dealing with the religion. Of course, there are many things he didn't do which he didn't like, personally. We're not talking about those. We're talking about things connected with the religion. The things he didn't do, it is sunnah not to do. Very important. 
Because if one opens this door, that as long as he said this, he said that, we can put it all together and come up with something which he didn't do, then the religion becomes innovated. You can now change the religion at will. Because I can bring something to you, I say to you. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, Prayer in Jama'ah is worth 27 times prayer by yourself. Everybody knows this. He also said, Whenever you enter the masjid, you should pray two rak'at, two units of prayer, before sitting down. Everybody knows this. Let us put the two together. We come into the masjid, I now suggest to you, let us make tahiyatul masjid in jama'ah. If I suggest that, what do people say? He said, no, 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 you can't do that. Why not? Prophet ﷺ said, the prayer in jama'ah is worth more than the prayer by yourself. He also said, whenever you come in, you should do this two rakah. Why can't we put them together and do it? Well, the Prophet ﷺ didn't do it. That's why, yes. He didn't do it, so we cannot do it. He made tahajjud in jama'ah. This is also sunnah. And he did it in jama'ah. We can do it because he did it. But to do tahiyat al-masjid in jama'ah, or to do the sunnahs before dhuhr, the sunnahs after dhuhr in jama'ah, we can't do it because Prophet Muhammad ﷺ didn't do it. And that's emphasized by his well-known statement, مَا تَرَكْتُ شَيْئًا يُقَرِّبُكُمْ إِلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَأَمَرْتُكُمْ بِهِ I didn't leave anything which would bring you closer to Allah without instructing you to do it. That's the bottom line. If it's going to bring you closer to Allah, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ told us to do it. If he didn't tell us to do it, it will not bring you closer to Allah no matter how good you think this is, how, you know, how much reasoning you give behind it, it will not bring you closer to Allah. It will take you farther away from Allah. This is the basic principle based on the statement of the Prophet Muhammad Man ahdatha fi amrina ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad. Whoever introduces anything new in this religion of ours, not approved by Allah and by the Messenger of Allah, it is rejected. This is to protect the religion in its pristine purity from change, deviation, etc., like what happened to the other religion, the other messages which were of Islam but became distorted in time, like that of Christianity, Judaism, etc., etc. So, when we come to ibadah, we recognize that it means worshipping Allah alone. It should be worshipping Allah with sincerity. Because to worship Allah alone, but insincerely, as a ritual, then of course, we're not worshipping Allah as He deserves to be worshipped. There's no real reward in that worship. Furthermore, it means worshipping Allah as Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu taught us to worship Allah. Not as we might feel or think or imagine or deduce, but we worship Allah as Rasulullah Sallallahu taught us to worship Allah. And connected to all of this, of course, is the concept that worship of Allah is not limited to the rituals of worship, but it also involves the emotional aspects wherein we should not love others more than we love Allah. To do so is to worship or to give an aspect of worship to Allah's creation. As Allah stated in the Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ and there is among human beings those who take for worship others besides Allah as equals to Him. But Allah goes on to say, وَالَّذِينَ amanu ashaddu حُبًّا لِلَّهِ And those who believe, they love Allah more. Their love of Allah is greater. This is the sign of belief, true belief. So where are relatives, our children, 
our friends, people on our job, these people become more beloved to Allah, to us than Allah. Meaning that when they ask us to do things, we will do them knowing that they involve disobeying Allah, then we have loved them more than we love Allah. Also, it involves putting our trust in Allah, ultimately, above all other things. It involves fearing Allah above all other things. If we fear the people in our jobs, we might lose the job if we do this thing which Islam requires of us, then we, in that fear, fear others more than we fear Allah. And these are internal aspects of worship. We have the external aspects and we have the internal aspects. And also, when we attribute the right to make halal and haram to human beings, meaning that where Allah has said this thing is halal, then people come along and say, no, it is haram. And we accept that. In this regard, we also have worshipped other than Allah. There's an element of worship here. And of course, some people say, how, how, where? Prophet ﷺ, he quoted a verse from the Quran on one occasion, describing the Christians and the Jews, saying, They have taken their rabbis and monks as lords besides Allah. This is Surah Tawbah, verse 31. When he said that, Adi ibn Hatim, one of his companions, who was a convert from Christianity, he said, O Messenger of Allah, we didn't used to worship them. We didn't take them as lords. Prophet ﷺ said, didn't they make halal what Allah made haram, and make haram what Allah made halal, and you followed them? He said, yeah, that's true. He said, that was your worship of them. So, worship may involve also allowing people to make haram and halal for us what goes against the clear instructions from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes, of course, it doesn't mean each and every instance this may be classified that way because it may be in ignorance. For example, you have commonly uh, some people following a particular school of thought, they jump up and say, shrimps, eating shrimps is haram. And crabs. And lobsters. We can't eat these things. We say, what is your evidence? Did Rasulullah forbid them? Did the Quran forbid them? No, but. No, there's no but. If, it, there, if we don't have the evidence, then we don't have the right to prohibit them. Because all foods are halal for us, except those which have been specifically prohibited. This is the principle which governs food, drink, clothing, you know, our dealings, worldly dealings, needs, etc. All are halal except those things which are specifically prohibited. Whereas ibadat, things which have to do with worship, which are specifically designed for worship, all forms of worship are prohibited except those which have been specifically been made permissible by Rasulullah That's the opposite. To protect it from innovation. So, when we come to those kind of issues where people are coming around and saying, this is haram, this is halal, so and so. You know, if it goes against what we know from the Quran, from the Sunnah of Rasulullah we must ask them for evidence. No matter how great a maulana or sheikh or so and so may be, if they are saying this is haram, we must ask them for the evidence. What is the proof? If they can't bring us proof, they are just take, telling us, well in my opinion and in so and so's opinion and this one's opinion and that one's opinion, we say, thank you, but no thank you. That basically covers our introduction to Aqidah, Usul Al-Aqidah. Now, uh, we'll take some questions for about 10 minutes. Uh,
It's short. We're leaving additional questions to the last session in the evening where we have gone over our allotted time. Normally the sessions we try to keep it within an hour, though some of them are longer than others. Okay, we'll take the first question. If the Quran uh, speaks against sects forming different groups, etc., uh, in the community, uh, why do Muslims do this? Well, the Quran prohibits drinking alcohol. Why do Muslims drink alcohol? The Quran prohibits so many things, but Muslims are doing them. You know, it's just a part of the whole system that though Islam may prescribe one thing, human beings have a choice of either following what Allah has prescribed or not. So where they choose not to, then they disobey. You know, this is error. Sometimes it's a matter of ignorance. They don't know it. This is what they've grown up with. This is what everybody was doing in their area. That's what they were practicing. That's how they understood Islam. See, sometimes it's innocent. Sometimes it has to do with their own choice. And of course Allah will judge them according to whether it was a deliberate choice where they understood and knew better but they went and did it or whether it was something out of ignorance they didn't have any opportunity to understand otherwise and they made that mistake as a result of it. Go ahead. Um, I know some people who go to gatherings where they keep moving around and they start to chant and they give salam to the prophet. Our brother's question concerning gatherings where people prepare certain foods and they gather around it and they make certain chants, they make certain du'as or whatever you know and then they distribute this food in different ways and they call it niyaz or something like this right um, is that shirk? well I wouldn't necessarily say it's shirk depending on what people believe in it because you have some people who believe that when they do that the Prophet ﷺ becomes present in their gatherings yeah if, you, if this is what you believe, then there's some aspect of shirk happening here. But if it is just that you feel that um, you know, Allah's blessings will be on this, and when you give this food, you get reward from it, so in other words, you feel this is a righteous deed, then we say this is bid'ah, innovation in the religion, because Prophet Muhammad did not do it. Question from sisters? I'm going to take one, one. Well, our sister's question in terms of the Shia, do we consider them as being involved in shirk or are they practicing bid'ah? I would say both. They're practicing bid'ah and they're following practices of shirk. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they become non-Muslims because we have in the body of quote-unquote Sunni Muslims those who are doing the same. Those who are going to the graves of the saints, Ajmer in India, for example, a great gathering place of thousands, hundred thousand Muslims go there and pray to the dead person in the grave there. Okay? And they call themselves Sunni Muslims. Well, they're involved here in aspects of shirk as well as bid'ah. So these acts, of course, uh, though forbidden in Islam, etc., it doesn't necessarily mean that it makes a person a non-Muslim. Only if that person has understood what is wrong in what they have, they're practicing, what is correct has been made clear to them, and they reject that, at that point they become in fact disbelievers. And that is left to Allah. Because we don't need to make this judgment. Because again, some people might say, well I went to this person who was going to the grave, and I told him, and I brought the evidence to him, and he still went. Well, it may be that the way you brought the evidence, he wasn't able to understand. Maybe the language you used. Maybe your explanation was weak. In a variety of different things. Allah knows whether that person actually grasped it and decided otherwise. So that ruling of disbelief, that is left to Allah. It's not on us now to go and tell Muslims, you are a kafir, you Muslim, you are a kafir. No. 
We can say, yes, you're involved in some aspects of shirk here. You know, beware, so and so, we advise them, so and so. These are actions of kufr, so and so. But to say, you are a kafir, we don't have that right. You know, Allah, that judgment is left to Allah. Unless the person openly tells you, I am a kafir. I don't believe. I reject that which is clear and obvious from the religion. Okay, brother's question. The raising of the hands in dua after every prayer. Is it just the raising of the hands in jama'ah along with the imam, which everybody knows clearly Prophet ﷺ didn't do that? Or is it just the raising of hands by yourself? If you just, as an individual, not in jama'ah, but after every prayer you raise your hand, that is also bid'ah. Because we have no evidence that the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands after every prayer. We, in fact, we have other evidence that he didn't. So for you to make it a regular practice, after every prayer you must raise your hands in dua, you have made a bid'ah, an innovation. Now if you do it on occasion, the mood catches you, you feel like it, you raise your hands on occasion, no problem. But when you fix it as a ritual, after every prayer you're doing it, now you have innovated. And the sisters? Yeah, after this, next session. Uh, sister's question concerning the sunnah of doing and the sunnah of not doing. Where I stress that this is in matters of religion. The sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu was to eat, to not eat dab, you know, which is a desert lizard. It was served, people ate it in Arabia. It was offered to him, he didn't eat it. That was his sunnah not to eat it. But we are not obliged to follow that sunnah. Because that was his personal dislike and he said it. Right? So where the Prophet Sallallahu had a personal dislike, we're not obliged to follow that. Or where he had a personal like, for example, when he went to the marketplace, he wanted to get a pair of sandals. He chose a particular style of sandals. One which had two straps, made from cow's leather, red colored, reddish colored, from Yemen, with the hair scraped off. You can find this description of his sandals in Shamail at Tirmidhi. Now, is that deen? Is that something that we as Muslims should try to follow? No. It's not required of us. That was his personal like. And that's what he chose. We're not obliged to follow that. That is not considered a part of the deen. Of course, some people in ignorance, there's a book called Shamal al-Tirmidhi, translated originally into Urdu, from there into English, which was around. Uh, I, mean, I had a copy of it. Where the author, after looking at this hadith, the hadith combined, uh, compiled by Imam al-Tirmidhi, scholar of hadith, Describing the sandal of the Prophet ﷺ, he in his commentary went on to explain the benefits from the sandal. If you drew a picture of the sandal, you put it under your pillow, this is going to happen for you, and that is going to happen, and you know, hey, we say, where did this come from? You know, where did this come from? Right? This is where a person has gone off. Right? So, if we take those things, which are personal preferences of the Prophet Sallallahu in day-to-day -day life, which has nothing to do with religion, and we make it a part of the religion, either we are making bid'ah, in that we are offering these other rewards in this way, as people did, or we are making the religion re restricted to per certain parts of the world. Because if that was from the Sunnah, and this is preferable for us to do, then what are we saying about the practice of this for the Eskimos. Now if they were to choose a pair of sandals with two straps and go out you know, in the North Pole there, they would get frostbite and have to have their legs amputated. Now we're saying basically they can't get the reward of the Sunnah. No. The Sunnah, where it has to do with religion, this is something 
applicable universally. Those things which are personal, you will find them limited to particular areas, particular periods of time. Well, the term Rafida was applied uh, by scholars to those who rejected. Rafida from Raft means to reject. Those are the rejectors, right? Rafida means reject. And there was a uh, disagreement which developed amongst some of the descendants of, of um, of, uh, of Ali from Hussein in which one of the sons went one way and one of the other sons went another way those who rejected the way of one of the sons became known as the Rafida this is what they use it as one of the terms because those who rejected and went along with the other line these end up in practical terms to be those who are known as the uh, Tover Shiites the mainstream Shiites. Rafada really applies to the Twelvers. Although some people take it to mean the extremists amongst them. But in general, really, it ref refers to mainstream Shiism as we know it. Also, if Ashariya the... Ashariya is the Twelvers, meaning they follow the Twelve Imams. Well, uh, uh, that's news to me, sister. I don't know. If you have a hadith on that, to that effect, which is authentic, then, uh, then we can say that's the case. I have never come across such hadith. Not that I have come across every hadith that there exists, but I don't know it. Uh, if, you know, if you can bring it, then we can look at it. <laughs> okay, sister, clarifying that this explanation is from books written in Urdu where there is no evidence for it. Inshallah. Did you ask a question before? Okay, go ahead. Okay, brother's asking if a person wears a pendant which says Allah or Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu or it has Ayatul Kursi we could say even I have some pendants like that Ayatul Kursi is etched on it right is this considered shirk well it depends if you believe that in wearing this it will protect you then yes you have entered into shirk but if you are wearing it because you feel it is Jewelry, it looks attractive and you like it and you're wearing it as a, an accessory. Right? Of course, as a man wearing it around your neck, this is questionable anyway because then you're starting to look like women, right? This is the, that's another issue, right? Men wearing chains and stuff like this. This is considered imitation of the dress of females. But for a woman wearing these things, uh, we would, if she's not believing that this is going to protect her in any way, then it's not considered to be uh, an aspect of shirk. Alaikum <laughs> salam wa Okay, I didn't say don't raise your hands when making dua. Please get this clear, right? I didn't say that. I'm saying don't make it a regular practice. What I'm saying is sometimes you may raise your hands while making dua and other times you make your dua without raising your hands. This is the point. Let us not feel that the only way to make dua is you must raise your hands. This is not the case. You can make dua without raising your hands. Right? So this is what I'm saying the making of dua also during the time of sujood this is the time Prophet recommended this or 
times when uh, du'as are accepted. One may do so in the salah at that point also. Uh, the idea after prayer, you know, to ask people to pray for the dead. Somebody has died, they're asking to pray for the dead. The idea of prayer for the dead is in by itself is okay. One may do so. You know, asking Allah's forgiveness for this person who has died, etc. But where it becomes a ritual, Yarhamkullah. Where it becomes a ritual, you know, after prayers regularly, people are asking, and this is just a standard practice, then we have now innovation here. We have a kind of innovation. On occasion, if somebody asks, you know, the Imam, it's just like asking somebody to pray for you, you know, and they make a dua, and when they finish making the dua, you say, Amin, for example. You know, may Allah, Amin meaning, may Allah accept it. Pardon? Mm -hmm. Okay. The evil of what Allah has created. Now, when Allah created the fish spine you know in the fish it's got a backbone with these like spines on it right that backbone with the spines in the fish was a good thing it kept the fish's body together so he could swim in the water etc now if that spine any of the pieces of that spine we call it a fish bone if that sticks in your throat that's an evil thing Relative to yourself, that becomes an evil thing. So there is evil coming out of what Allah has created in that context. You understand? So we're not saying Allah created this to harm you, but harm may come out of it. Or rain. Rain is a good thing. But sometimes rain becomes a terrible thing. So there's this harm which comes out of rain, but is rain in and out of itself evil? No. Yeah, okay, this is uh, another example of, in our lives, the um, issue of evil with good intent is that of the dentist injecting in your gums Novocaine or whatever, it is something painful. The needle is so long, you can feel it tickling your toes. Right? Nobody likes the dentist's needle. Hmm? But we subject ourselves to it on a regular basis to prevent greater harm, which is the rotting of our teeth and the root canals and everything else. So that evil, what appears to us external of that circumstance to be something evil, is in fact something good for us. It may be a relative thing, for example, where I remember one occasion uh, seeing a uh, picture in the newspaper, uh, I, I cut it out, where they had this Egyptian in the, uh, brother, and it had on one side his sister was kissing him on one cheek, and his brother, uh, his father was kissing him on the other cheek. And he had this huge smile from ear to ear, you know, his thumbs were up like this. And I read the caption, you know, what was it? What had happened was, he was supposed to catch a particular flight, the Gulf Air flight, last year, which was going to Bahrain. Now this air flight crashed in the sea. When he had gone to the airport to catch his flight, he was refused the right to go on that flight because he was missing a stamp on his passport 
And in Egypt, you have to have a thousand stamps before you can do anything. Right? Yeah, so many people have to stamp. So he had gotten all his stamps except for one stamp. And there he was at the airport, one stamp missing, they wouldn't allow him. Of course, his whole world was falling apart around him because he was a teacher. It was a flight of teachers. They were going back to the beginning of the new term. He had to go back and teach. So to miss, to come back late, maybe they will fire him. They're going to take off pay or whatever. He was terrible. His world crashed around him. He was begging, screaming, please. No. Flight took off. Then he heard the flight crashed. And everybody on board died. So there he was in the, pic in the newspaper the next day. Big smile on his face. You know. That which he thought was such a terrible calamity the day before was now fortune, good fortune for him. So in that relative sense, though it was evil, in the sense of what happened to the other people, for that individual, it was good. And his friends experience with those who disbelieve among their friends uh, where they are saying basically this belief in God was a result of people's ignorance in the past not understanding and being able to explain the phenomena in the world around them they had to resort to God to explain it and now we know what is going on in the world around us we don't need to resort to God anymore well the reality is that we don't know what is going on in the world around us. We really don't know. It is a delusion, an arrogance on the part of human beings to claim that we actually do know what is going on in the world around us. If you ask them, do you believe in the mind? Right? They say yes. Ancient people believed in the mind and you still believe in the mind. Have you ever seen a mind? Hmm? Can you show me your mind? Because is the mind the brain? You see what I'm saying? So we say, hey, just in the same way you believe in the mind, as the ancient people who believed in the mind, they couldn't see it, you can't see it, but you still believe. Are you going to say, well, that was the ancient belief, let's forget it, we don't have minds anymore? No. Okay? So we say that just because something was believed in the past, and... It is something which could not be seen and measured by science, etc. It doesn't necessarily mean that it was wrong. In the previous session, we completed our look at the major categories of Tawheed. Now we will look at the opposite, the antithesis, the major categories of Shirk. And in fact, these categories all match the categories of Tawheed. As we have the unity in maintaining uh, Allah's oneness, His unique oneness with regards to His dominion, we have Shirk in that same uh, regard. And as we have the unity of maintaining Allah's oneness, in his names and attributes, we also have shirk in that regard. And we have talked about some aspects of shirk so far in them. And also, with regards to maintaining the unity of Allah with, in worship, you have also shirk in this regard too. And what we're going to do now is basically identify the major areas of, uh, of shirk on a systematic uh, basis in these three uh, aspects. The first, and why I want to stress the importance of, of understanding this, understanding the shirk in here in this regard, because of the fact that Allah has stated in the Quran 
in no uncertain terms in Surah An-Nisa verse 48 إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَنْ يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Indeed Allah will not forgive the association of partners that is shirk with him but he forgives sins lesser than that to whomsoever he wishes. So Allah has placed this issue of shirk on a very high level in terms of danger. You know, this is the unforgivable sin. If a person dies in this state knowing that it is wrong but insisting on following it, then they have condemned themselves to hell. And this is why when people raise the issue, you Muslims, what, you know, what do you say about Mother Teresa? You know, she was such a good person, lived such a righteous life, serving you know, the needs of humankind, and basically you're saying because she is Christian, she's going to hell. You know, that, that doesn't make sense. What kind of religion is this? Well, the point is that though on one hand she may have, might have done some very good deeds with regards to human beings serving humanity, this kind of things in this life. On the other hand, she has done, as far as we can see, the greatest possible sin. Shirk. She has worshipped Jesus instead of worshipping Allah. And that cancels the value of the good deeds that she has done. It is far outweighs the good that she has done. See, they can only see the good and they cannot see how great the evil that she is involved in becomes. Because we ask them, so you as a Christian, what do you think of Sai Baba? Sai Baba who does a lot of good things for Indian people who worship him believing that he is God right some 8 to 10 million Indians believe that Sai Baba is God incarnate including the president of India right now Sai Baba has projects which are philanthropic serving the needs of people and helping what do you say about Sai Baba do you think he's going to paradise uh, the Christians can say, no, 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 he's not going to paradise. Why? Look at all the good that he has done. Well, in the same way, you are going to negate all the good that he has done because he promotes the idea that he is God. In the same way, we negate all the good that Mother Teresa has done, you know, because of her belief that Jesus was God. Right? If she died in that state, knowing otherwise then she is relegated to hell forever technically speaking we cannot say mother Teresa will be in hell forever we can't say that technically because we are not allowed to say anybody will be in paradise to say so and so is a martyr or to say so and so will be as an individual among the people of hell unless Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said so and so will be in paradise so and so is in hell because Allah knows the circumstances of people we can say in general those people who are practicing this belief we know as Christianity are going to hell they're headed for hell that is a system of disbelief it is a system of paganism it is you know everything idolatry so it is and it's people in hell but we cannot say it for individuals we don't have the authority to say that about individuals because Allah knows what they actually believed what was actually brought to them etc and there is a particular hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari which clarifies that for us. And it's the hadith of the man who when the time for him to die came he told his children to burn his body to pound 
it into ashes and to sprinkle some of the ashes on the land and some on the sea as he said because if Allah caught a hold of me you know he's gonna really punish me so they did what he instructed them to do and then Allah told the earth and the sea to give up his ashes and to bring him back and he was brought before Allah and Allah asked him why did you tell your people your family to do that he said out of my fear of you O Allah and Allah said because of it you are forgiven and you're going to paradise okay though if you were to say today I'm gonna have myself cremated because that way Allah is not going to be able to get a hold of me we say this is shirk this is a statement of shirk because you're denying Allah's ability to resurrect you to bring you back but in this man's case because it was out of his fear sincere fear of Allah Allah forgave the wrong act which he did which was an act of shirk and kufr and gave him paradise so that's why we say Prophet really re revealed that to us informed us of that to let us know that in the end you cannot judge just as he also told us one of the first people who will be put in the hellfire will be the quote unquote martyr he said that individual Allah will ask him what did you do with the courage and the power etc which I gave you and the man will say I use this for your sake oh Allah I fought for your sake I fought in defense of the faith and I gave up my life for your sake and Allah will say you lied you did not fight for my sake you fought so that people would say what a brave man what a courageous man what a hero and it was said he will be drawn away on his face and thrown into hell this is why it is wrong to say so and so is a martyr we don't know if Prophet Muhammad said so and so is a martyr then we can say yes so and so was a martyr otherwise the most we can say is this person we hope he will be a martyr inshallah Allah will accept what he has done as an act of martyrdom but we cannot say with a surety that that person is in fact a martyr because when you say a person is a martyr what you're saying is they are going to paradise you are defining here who is going to paradise in that regard and we are not allowed to do that and we have many occasions in the life of Prophet Muhammad where he pointed this out after one of the battles he was walking amongst the dead and some of the companions with them were with him and they said so and so was a martyr so and so was a martyr he didn't say anything so and so was a martyr so -and -so. he said no he said why not he said, all the other people that they said was martyr his silence approved their statement but that's one person he said no he's not a martyr he said why O messenger of Allah we saw him fighting like this he said no he fought for the spoils and they went when they moved his body over they found inside of his cloak he had stolen some of the uh, booty from the battle so that's what he was fighting for you see externally it looked like he died along with everybody else a martyr but his intention was different and had the Prophet ﷺ not told them they would not have known and that's why we don't have the authority to define who is a martyr and who is a not, who is not because that requires revelation so we're looking now at shirk shirk in rububiyya first and foremost in the concept of Allah's dominion over all things this may take place in two ways one which we call shirk by association Yarhamkullah. shirk by association or the other way uh, shirk 
by negation. Now, shirk by association means that one or other of Allah's powers have become personified as gods. Either it's in the case of the Zoroastrians who have the god of good and the god of evil which I spoke about before. Or it could be in the form of the Hindus who believe in the supreme being Brahman. Brahman as being the single being, the one, the absolute. They believe, Hindus believe in one God. But they also believe that some of God's powers, his powers being the creator, is represented by a God, Brahma. His powers as being the preserver is represented by the God Vishnu. And his power of being the destroyer is represented by the God Shiva. So they have a trinity of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva which they worship as individual powers of God. Unlike the Christians, they also have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three gods in one. Similar situation where God's attributes become manifest, he becomes carnate, whatever, and he is worshipped as some divisible being. And this is also manifest in the arguments of the Christians when they want to explain to us how God can be three and, and one at the same time. They have a variety of theories. We know the egg theory, you know, which is common. They say, well, just as the egg is comprised of the white, the yolk, and the shell, well, it's all one egg. They say, well, that's how God is. We said, that's how an egg is. That's not God, okay? For you, your God is like an egg. For us, God is not like anything. It is creation, okay? Similarly, they have what is known as the tree theory. The tree theory uh, involves uh, believing, as they say, explain, that as a tree has branches, it has a trunk, and it has roots, these all parts make up the one God, we say, that's a tree. We don't believe God is divisible into parts like a tree. Or they have the water theory. right? As water can be liquid, it can be a gas, or it can be a solid in the form of steam and form of ice. I say, in that way, God. We say, no, that's water. It's not God. So, this kind of representation of God, in these ways, this is similar, uh, represents shirk by association, where God becomes manifest in different ways, and those ways are worshipped uh, by uh, people as being separate gods, yet at the same time in their explanations, it is one God. And you also have uh, among Sufi uh, channels, those who believe in what they refer to as Rijalul Ghayb, the people of the unseen world. That group is headed by the Qutb or the Pole. Right? And they believe that you know, certain things take place in this world by their actions. So they have associated powers in this world along with Allah. So in this way, shirk is happening by associationism. We also have, as we said, shirk by negation. This is basically denying God's existence. Those who say there is no God. You have some religions like ancient Buddhism which didn't, doesn't believe in a God at all. Ancient Buddhism didn't be, doesn't believe in God at all. There's no God. What for them is God, what they treat as God is that the individual whose spirit goes through the different stages and finally is released in the, in the, in the experience of nirvana that this spirit becomes 
a free agent that is able to do things in this world and you pray to that spirit but that's not God they just replace God with the spirits these free spirits that have reached this particular stage the other branch which is the more common branch of Buddhism today they have turned Buddha into a God and they just worship Buddha that's the more common version and you have other religions like the Jains Jainism they also don't have a God but similarly all of these that uh, deny it you know they also elevate other aspects of Allah's creation whether it be the souls of the liberated uh, beings you know as having being becoming immortal and omniscient and omnipotent etc they have turned these actually into God they've given God's attributes to some of his creation people like Pharaoh who said to Musa when he called him to the belief in Allah Ana rabbukum al -a'la, I am your Lord most high this is an example he is denying the existence of a Lord you know told Haman listen build this big old uh, ladder for me let me go up and have a look at you know Musa's God you know, I don't believe there's any God up there anyway right I am your Lord most high this is an example of uh, denial of God's existence you have philosophers people like Jean Paul Sartre and, and uh, Hume and others also in the history of, West, of, of uh, Western thought philosophical thought who denied God's existence Marxism Marxist Leninism which you know is communism this is also a system which elevated the denial of God to state a state religion you know prior to this denial of God's existence remained as the belief of a few and this is why when we look into the Quran and the Quran addresses issues of belief in Allah very few verses actually address the concept of those who deny God's existence altogether they always go from you believe in, in God in this respect well this is how you should believe in God in all respects right as Allah said in the Quran وَلَا إِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَيَكُولَنَّ اللَّهِ If you ask them who created the heavens and the earth, they'll say Allah. But they have errors in this belief in Allah. Whereas there are few verses in the Quran where Allah addresses those who actually don't believe in God at all. Because these have always been a minority in human existence. Of course, as I said, with this 20th, 20th century, it was elevated to state religion in Russia in China and elsewhere communism the disbelief in God's existence became a part of the religion of the state I didn't call it religion but in fact it became their religion and what happened is that though this was officially propagated the mass of the people still believed in God so there is still a minority though it became as I said state religion officially so people if they wanted to graduate from school or they wanted to get certain posts they had to externally repeat these claims that God doesn't exist internally they didn't really believe it and that's why when these systems fell you found people rushing back to religion because now there was no pressure on them they were free they left those beliefs because it was only an external thing How, and in any case what we could point out is that even those people who deny God's existence if you actually pin them down they do have gods that they worship they do because everybody has to have a God it is their explanation for things you find it there if you go and you ask that individual who's an atheist, okay, you don't believe there's a God. Now, you are a successful businessman. However, such and such a person, who was your classmate, who came from a similar background as you, who graduated with all the different things, he is an utter failure. Why? Utter failure, why? What does he say? my good luck his bad luck and if you go and you pin him down 
to the various events which are taking place in his day or her day you will find them when you ask them what about this they say good luck what about that bad luck what about this good luck what about that bad luck so you find they're saying bad luck and good luck controls the whole of their life in the end and the other term which they use instead of luck they say fortune my good fortune now the term fortune right comes from the Greek term fortuna which is the name of the goddess of good and bad luck fortuna so that's their god fortune the ancient Greek goddess of course when we assign the powers of God to a blind force like fortune and luck what this does is it eliminates the requirements of worship right? now if it's a personal God who has consciousness etc then you have to deal with well what does God want from me but now when you look at it as a blind force then you don't have to deal with that so really it's just an escape from dealing with the obligations of belief in God that's just a substitute so don't let them fool you into thinking they don't have a God they do have gods every last one of them now the other area of shirk is shirk in al asma wa sifat in, in Allah's names and attributes this also occurs in two ways one which we call shirk by humanization and the other which we call shirk by deification huh? by deification those of you who may have difficulty reading that word in English please don't pronounce it as defecation right? because that has a whole different meaning altogether eh? it's deification which means making something or someone a god all right so humanization what this refers to is making God like his creation that God has a form whether it is a human form or an animal form or whatever form this is in general we can call it shirk by humanization why because people generally speaking represent God in human form human beings looked at as being the highest stage of creation then they more commonly represent God uh, in their own form and of course historically speaking you know this is what Christianity has portrayed you know when they uh, promote the idea that Jesus was God right and they have their paintings Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel where he spent so many months and years on his back painting this picture you know the famous picture you see of this man reaching down and the other man reaching up and there's like their fingers are like this and this representing God giving the spark of life to Adam you know of course when they represent God he is represented as a European you know with a big long white beard right and in this way when they promote this to be the understanding of God in the rest of the non-European world then they are subtly you know putting in the people's minds subliminally promoting to them that we Europeans are closer to God we are God-like you know and this creates in the minds of the non-Europeans a desire to look like a European you know so you'll find them doing all kinds of things whether it's skin whiteners or it's you know cutting the slits out of your eyes or you know people into this whole uh, uh, practice of trying to look like a European because it has been promoted to them that this is godlike closer to God right and of course it's, it's, the, it's the nature of people to do this right I don't necessarily believe that this was a an insidious plan by the you know Christians of Europe that they were trying to really make everybody believe but that's just the natural consequence that people who make images of God tend to make images of God looking like themselves so when you go to the Buddhists and Buddhism has spread from from India it's you don't find it in India anymore though it was a reform movement in in Hinduism you find it in Sri Lanka Cambodia in uh, Japan now if you go 
to Sri Lanka, Buddha looks like a Sri Lankan. If you go to Cambodia, he looks like a Cambodian. You go to Japan, he looks like a Japanese. You know, this is the nature of people when they're going to represent the God to the, you know, their own people. They try to make that God look like themselves. Right? So, this is the, uh, the natural consequence which you know, happens from trying to represent God in his creation. The other form, shirk by deification, this involves uh, giving Allah's attributes to his creation. We spoke about that in Shiaism and etc. Now, whether we uh, look at individuals, and, and I mentioned the, as one example, the Nusairis, which is a branch of Shiaism, followed by the ruling class of Syria. Right? The Nusairis, Hafid Asad, his son, and the others, they belong to this group of Shiites who call themselves Alawis, they are called Alawis or Nusairis, they believe, and the mass of Syrians don't believe this, mass of Syrians are quote-unquote Sunni Muslims. But the ruling class, they believe that Allah became manifest in human form as Muhammad, وسلم, Ali, and Salman al-Farisi. This is their belief. And this takes them right out of Islam. That is kufr in reality. Right? Now, also, if we look at uh, Sufi groups who have given powers, you know, amongst Muslims who call themselves Sunni Muslims, you have those who have given uh, powers of Allah to human beings. Powers which only belong to Allah. And where they have done that, they have committed shirk by deification. The statement of Al Halaj, you know, saying, An al Haq, you know, I am the embodiment of truth, you know, as Allah said, describing himself, Wahu al Haq, he describes himself as being Al Haq. For any Muslim to say, An al Haq, he's basically saying, I'm Allah. So he's giving Allah's attribute of being the uh, embodiment of truth to himself. This becomes shirk by deification. The other area of shirk by deification is an area that many of us have, have inadvertently participated in when we went to our high school and we learned Einstein's theory of relativity. When we wrote in our books E equals MC squared, we were writing a statement of shirk. E equals MC squared is a statement of shirk. Yes, people split the atom with it and you know everything else, but the reality from an Islamic perspective is that this statement E equals MC squared, which is E represents energy equals MC, that is the uh, square, this is the, the mass times the square of the speed of light. This is how it is put in uh, actual formula. But when it is expressed as a statement, it is said that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. This is what they say. Energy transforms into matter. Matter transforms back into energy. You know, this is the concept, a closed system. So when you say energy can either be created or destroyed, what are you saying here? You're saying that energy has no beginning nor end. And that is Allah. Only Allah is without beginning or end. And Allah, of course, has said in the Quran, وَهُوَ خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ He is the creator of everything. Therefore, energy was created by Allah. And Allah also said, كُلُّ مَا عَلَيْهَا فَانْ Everything in this world will disappear. It will end. Go out of existence. And Allah will bring it back. So everything has an end. Energy will end. It has a beginning and it has an end. That is the correct belief. So therefore, those of us that are still in our studies and we have to learn this thing, 
In high school, what do we do? The teacher asks you what's Einstein's theory of relativity. What are you going to write in your book now? Now, if you write, hey, this is a statement of Shirk, I can't write it. <laughs> Guess what? You just failed your examination. So what you do is when you write this, E equals MC squared, you put in brackets after it, by man. By humankind. Okay, you're covered. Well, we accept that. As human beings, we cannot create or destroy energy. Now, of course, the Darwinian theory of evolution, this is also an explanation for everything which exists, as they say, without having to resort to God. So, they elevate the principle of survival of the fittest to God. It becomes the God. This is what is creating and developing and molding and shaping and all these different things. This principle of survival of the fittest. And, of course, as, as Muslims, we reject that. It is all in accordance with Allah's plan. Now, the last category of shirk is that in Tawheed al-ibadah that is in the area of worship where people have called human beings to worship other than Allah and the basic message of the prophets was to call people to the worship of Allah alone as Allah said وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُ اللَّهِ وَاجْتَنِبُ الطَّاغُوتِ in Surah Nahal verse 36 Allah said there surely I have sent to every nation a messenger saying worship Allah and avoid false gods. This is the essence of the message of Islam. So shirk, major shirk, shirk has been divided now into two aspects what we would call ash-shirk al-akbar, major shirk and ash-shirk al-asghar, minor shirk. Major shirk is this act of worshipping others instead of Allah, uh, besides Allah, along with Allah, all of these practices become a form, one or other, of shirk. And as we said before, as Tawheed has external aspects, shirk and, and internal aspects, shirk also has external and internal aspects. That a person may commit shirk externally by bowing before idols, bowing before others beside Allah. And internally, they can commit shirk by emotionally attaching themselves to some aspects of his creation. This is why Prophet ﷺ had said, Ta'isa abdu dirham wa abdu dinar. The worshipper of the dirham and the dinar will always be miserable. He called them worshippers of the dirham the dinar meaning the dollars and the pounds right? Right? those who worship it is. so he has identified meaning how does a person worship money money becomes the goal in life it becomes the be all and the end all of everything everything is judged according to money is it going to benefit me monetarily is it not going to benefit me monetarily I do or I don't do all on the basis of money this, then money becomes our God. And the God may be our desires. As Allah said, Ara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawa. Have you not seen the one who takes his desires as his God? Where the person does or doesn't do based on his or her desires. That's what is the deciding factor which controls whether they should do, whether they shouldn't do, you know, it is all based on their desires. Then the desires become our gods. And Shirk al Asghar, Prophet had said in a well known hadith 
The thing I fear most for you is a shirk al asghar minor shirk. The companions asked, O Messenger of Allah, what is minor shirk? He replied, Arriya. Arriya. That is praying or acting, doing an act of worship for admiration and praise to impress others. This is called Arriya. And he said, For verily, Allah will say on the day of resurrection when people are receiving their rewards go to those for whom you are showing off in the material world and see if you can find any reward for them that practice riya destroys the value of all of our good deeds and a riya is something we have to be particularly careful about as some of the companions like Ibn Abbas said, Riya is like the creeping, or it's more hidden than the creeping of a black ant on a black stone in the middle of a moonless night. This is how subtle it is. More subtle than a black ant creeping on a black stone in the middle of a moonless night. Meaning that it can catch us without us realizing it. Meaning we have to be constantly vigilant to ensure that our practices are free from riya, Things which would expose uh, us to desiring the admiration, the praise, etc. of others. And when we find ourselves in such a situation, then... We should say the dua, Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min an nushrika bika shay'a, shay'a na'lamuhu wa ma la na'lamu, wa nastaghfiruka lima la na'lam. That is, Allahumma inna na'udhu bika an nushrika bika shay'a na'lamu, wa nastaghfiruka lima la na'lam. O Allah, we seek refuge in you from knowingly committing shirk with you and we ask your forgiveness for what we do not know about. That represents the basic aspects of shirk in the major areas of Tawheed. Now, what remains for us is looking at shirk in some particular aspects where people have gone astray. One of the major areas wherein people have gone astray in shirk is in the area of, in Allah's names and attributes, sorry, is in the area of what we refer to as al-ulu or the transcendency of Allah. The concept of Allah being above and beyond His creation. A very important concept. Because for the mass of Muslims today, if you ask them where is Allah, their response will be, in general, Allah is everywhere. This is the common response of the mass of Muslims in the world today. However, the belief that Allah is everywhere is in fact the foundation of idolatry. It is a necessary foundation for those who believe in worshipping Allah through His creation. It is explained by this principle or this concept that Allah is everywhere. Now, if we ask for example the Hindu who believes in the one absolute God Brahman why he is worshipping this idol which he made with his own hands somebody made for him or whatever if he is the average Hindu who has not philosophized on the matter he will just or she will say this God brings me good 
I worship Ganesh, who is the elephant head god. He has the body of a human being and the head of an elephant. It's popular, Ganesh. And when I pray to him, I get good. My prayers are answered. I get rewards. That's why. No problem. And it's the same thing, same line of uh, argument, which sometimes when you're trying to explain Islam to Christians, they will say, I have experienced God, Jesus, in my life. You understand? You are believing this because you didn't experience Jesus in your life. You know, I have turned to him, I have prayed, and my prayers were answered. This is my proof. I know that Jesus is God. Right? This is the argument. So for that kind of argument, you take them back to the Hindu. Okay, what about the Hindu? Who prays to Ganesh and his or her prayers are answered. What do you think? Ganesh is God? Or the animist who prays to the trees or the rivers and their prayers are answered. What do you think? The trees and the rivers are God? Of course the Christian will say no. These are not God. So I said then, who is answering their prayers? The God, real God. It's God who is answering their prayers. Not the rivers and the trees or the idols. It's God. And we say the same thing with Jesus. You think that Jesus is answering your prayers. But it is God who is answering your prayers. And really, the difference between Ganesh and Jesus is only semantics. They're only words. In reality, Jesus was part of God's creation just as Ganesh and the others are part of God's creation. So in the same way, it wasn't God answering those who prayed to his creation, whether they were praying to stones and sticks or to idols. It is also God not answering, it's God who is answering the prayer and not the individual, the human being who you believe to be God. But now if you speak to the educated Hindu, who has philosophized his religion, he studied under a few yogis or whatever, and you ask him or her, why are you worshipping this object of your own creation? They'll say, we're not worshipping it. Please don't misunderstand. We are not worshipping this idol that you see before you. No. We are worshipping Brahman. The one absolute God. Who is everywhere. Pervades everything. But at the time of our worship of our idol, Brahman becomes concentrated inside of the idol. So we're worshipping God who is concentrated in the idol and not the idol itself. Just like you. You're worshipping the Kaaba. And we say, no, 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 we're not worshipping the Kaaba. We're worshipping God. So it's the same thing. You know, there you are bowing down to this black cube and you insist that you're not worshipping it, but you're bowing down before it. Of course, there is a qualitative difference. Right? There is a difference here. Because for those who worship these idols, believing that God is concentrated in the idol, if you take away the idol, can they worship? No. They have to have the idol. Whereas, if somebody takes away the Kaaba, can we still worship? Of course we can. In fact, you can go inside of the Kaaba and worship. They would, it would be inconceivable for them to be climbing inside of their idols and worshipping. It doesn't work. That doesn't work. Okay? So there is a qualitative difference between what we're doing and what they're doing. Right? But, you know, unfortunately, Muslims confuse this issue in the minds of these people. You know? They confuse it. Why? By putting in their homes pictures of the Kaaba. Putting on their prayer rugs pictures of the Kaaba. So everywhere they go and they're going to pray, there is this image of the Kaaba. So to those externally who are looking at these things, it's just like we're worshipping the Kaaba. So it's wrong, really, to put pictures of the Kaaba on our prayer rugs, on our walls, and on this. It's wrong. It's error. 
And it misguides people. Of course, there's another point that you should know. That many Hindus have this belief concerning our worship of the Kaaba. Not what I just said. There's another belief that they have. One uh, Hindu from uh, England, living in Toronto, I was flying to England. And uh, he was sitting beside me, so we got in this conversation. And, you know, we became friendly. So he now felt he could ask me a question. He said, listen, you know, I have this question that's been bothering me all my life. But I couldn't ask any Muslim. I had Muslim friends, but I felt shy to ask them this, you know. But, you know, I can see you are open-minded and, you know, you're coming from a Western background. So, do you mind if I ask you this question? I said, sure, go ahead. He said, you know, uh, growing up, my parents told us, told me and my brothers and sisters, that inside the Kaaba, you have one of our gods called Shiva Lingam. <laughs> I started to laugh, of course, you know. <laughs> he, he looked at me, he smiled, he saw me laughing, you know. <laughs> and he said, yeah, that's what they told us, you know. It was in the, and also in, in Medina, that that's what you have there in that mosque of the Prophet. You've got Shiva Lingam there too. <laughs> well, I explained to him that, of course, no, this is not true, you know. We don't have any one of your idols inside of the Kaaba. <laughs> you know, you can go inside the Kaaba, it's open, there's nothing inside there. Uh, hmm? Anyway, so if you're giving dawah to Hindus, just be aware of this, that a number of them have this idea, this concept that we have inside of the Kaaba, one of their gods. And it's good for you actually when you're involved in this thing too, you should go and look up what Shiva Lingam stands for. You go up and look up what Lingam stands for and you'll be shocked. Right? Anyway, but it's good to know it because in the course of dawah with them, it's good to clarify these points because sometimes they don't even realize it themselves. You know? Anyway, what we're saying here is that this belief in God being everywhere is the basis of a number of these uh, individuals uh, who believe in idolatry. And it becomes the justification for Al-Hallaj, who we spoke about earlier, you know, is from the uh, 10th century, who claimed an al-haq, you know, he was a Sufi, uh, he became what they, what they call among the Sufi saints, who was put in the hierarchy of saints, and people will call on him, Al-Hallaj, he was known for this famous statement, an al-haq, when the Muslim judges brought him before them, you know, and asked him to retract the statement because of its implications. He stood up in the court and he opened up his cloak and said, there is nothing inside this cloak except Allah. So he removed from them any doubts about what he intended. At that point, the only thing left to do was to execute him. So they cut off his head. Of course, the Sufis in their books, they write, that when his head was cut off, and it hit the ground rolling. It kept on saying, An al haq, an al haq, an al haq. They said, Okay, this is proof that what he was saying was right. He was killed, you know, uh, wrongly, etc., etc. Really, he was on the truth. Of course, for us, even though this story is probably apocryphal, not authentic, if we concede to them that it did happen, no problem. Because if we go to the case of Prophet Musa, when he went to the top of Mount Tur to receive revelation, and he left behind Harun and the people, and that individual, a Samiri, he asked the people to give them his, their jewelry, he got their jewelry together, he melted it all down, and he threw in the mix some dust, as he said, from the footprint of an angel. Right? And from that he made the golden calf, and he called all the people around. And he said to them, This is the God of Moses. The one who Moses is going on top of the mount to, to receive revelation from. This is the God. This golden calf. Now do you think the people just said, MashaAllah, let's worship it. And they just bowed down and started worshiping the calf. No. People <laughs> were looking at this. Are you serious? You know. Then what happened? The cow said, Moo. That's what Allah says in the Quran. 
The cow lowed. It said, moo. He said, whoa, this is the God of Moses. They dropped down and bowed. When the cow communicated, right, this was what convinced the people that this was God. Now, how do we explain that? Did the cow actually low? No. We know that the jinn that can possess individuals as well as objects entered into the cow and said moo and the people thought it was the cow similarly the jinn can go into the head chopped off of halaj and keep saying an al haq an al haq an al haq if that's what you need they're there for you right? so we don't have a problem with that clear claim now of course we have other groups like uh, the Druze you hear about the Druze in Lebanon their belief also is that God became carnate human in the form of the last of the Fatimid rulers in Egypt called Al-Hakim bi Amrillah they believe that he became God in that person the uh, Ismaili Shiites Aga Khanis, right, whose leader is Abdul Karim Aga Khan, they believe that their Imam is God incarnate. In fact, when one of the earlier Imams of theirs, the one who was weighed and given his body weight in gold, in platinum, and in diamonds by his followers, when he was asked in Egypt, because they, they were based in Egypt, when he was asked, why do you allow your people to worship you? He said, in my country, people worship a cow. He's from India. Surely I'm better than a cow. <laughs> Another individual was known by Ibn Arabi. He was a Spanish Sufi who became very popular of the 12th century, 13th century. He, in his uh, writings and teachings, promoted the idea that everything was a law and a law was everything. Because when you say a law is everywhere, then you go inside of every atom, inside of every neutron and proton and electron and quark or whatever, you know, uh, individual particles our law is there so in the end what exists but Allah everything is Allah and Allah is everything and this is known as monism in English they refer to it philosoph philosophically as monism everything is Allah and Allah is everything Now this belief, in some of his writings, he told his people, why are you worshipping someone beyond you, God who is beyond you? God is in, in you and God is in me. You don't need to worship any God beyond yourself. You worship yourself. Right? This is clear deviation. Some people say, to say that Allah is above his creation is to put him in a place. This is one of the arguments. They say it's to put him in a place. Inside of the four um, dimensions of height, width, depth, so on and so on. They're putting him in a location. To say he's above. Well we say no. It is not. To say he is everywhere. Is to put him in a place. Because you've put him inside of his creation. That is putting him in a place. When we say he is beyond his creation. We're not putting him in a location. Because location. Came into existence. With creation. Allah. Is where he was before he created he's in the same place not bound by time space etc etc he's in the same place he's beyond his creation 
And when you go up in the creation, through the seven heavens, you end up with this, uh, the, the highest level of the seven heavens. When you, after that comes what? The kursi. The footstool, which is over everything. Wasiya kursi was samawati wal ard. His footstool encompasses the universe. And beyond that, above it, and the, um, the universe in relationship to the footstool is like a brass ring thrown in the middle of the desert. The desert being like the footstool and the whole of creation, the whole universe, which is expanding and all these other things, is like that brass ring in the middle of a desert. And the kursi, in relationship to the arsh, or the throne of Allah, is like the brass ring thrown in the middle of the desert. So what do you think we are like in relationship to the kursi? This is what Prophet ﷺ said, authentic narrations describing of creation. And Allah, and that is the end of creation. The, the, the arsh, that is the end of creation. What is beyond the arsh? Allah. Not inside of his creation, but beyond the creation. So we don't have to, you know, as he said, have the idea that Allah is behind some planet, etc., etc. No. Allah controls everything in the universe without having to be inside of it. You see, their idea is to make Allah like us. If you want to control things, you have to be inside. You have to be on the spot. But we, in our own way, look at the ability to do things by remote control as being advancements of technology. When we send a Mars uh, explorer to Mars and it gets down over there and we're here manipulating some things, sending the signals and the, the Mars lander comes out and it rolls around, picks up some earth and you know, does all this kind of stuff. We consider this an advancement in technology. We don't have to be on Mars to do that. So hey, if we can accept that as advancement, surely Allah is beyond that. Surely Allah is beyond that. He doesn't have to be inside of his creation to control it. Now, if one looks at proof, this is just some logical reasoning to deal with some of the arguments, reasoned arguments that they make. But if we go to human nature and we want to determine, because we're saying that belief in Allah as he is, is actually natural. It agrees with the basic nature with which people were created. If we want to understand the natural understanding, we need to go to the child. The little child, five years old, four years old, six years old. We ask that child, where is Allah? And of course his parents have indoctrinated him that Allah is everywhere. So he says, Allah is everywhere. And then you ask the child, is Allah in filth and places of filth? What is the child going to say? No, 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 no. No, no. You can't believe Allah is in filth. No. He'll reject that. The child, she will reject that right off. Naturally, they reject the idea that the creator of this universe is within filth of this world. That we consider nasty, we're flushing it away or whatever we're doing with it. And the child will then go on to give you examples of where Allah isn't. He will look around and say, Hey, Allah is not in my chair either. Because I'm sitting on the chair. Right? Doesn't make sense. Allah is not in my pencil. Because the, 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 the point breaks and I have to resharpen it again. Right? Allah is not in this place. Not, and it goes to all these different places. They will tell you where Allah isn't. Because naturally, they understand that it is against reason to accept that Allah is within these low, lowly states of his creation. Now of course when you're discussing with a person who has gone to school now, he graduated, he did philosophy 101 or whatever, you know, and um, you know, you're now trying to give this kind of discussion with that person and you put to the person, hey, you know, what do you think? You believe Allah is in filth? The person will stop for a minute. Ooh. Inside their hearts, they know 
this is not right. <laughs> but they don't want to lose the argument. That's what philosophy 101 taught you, right? You know, don't lose the argument. You can use this logic and that logic, whatever, and get out of any argument. So they say, yes. Though inside their hearts, they don't believe it. Because they don't want to lose the argument. So you can't, as I said, you want to check this natural proof, you've got to go to the kids. Because the kids are not about winning or losing the argument. They just tell you what comes to them naturally. Whereas adults, they have another agenda. Right? Now, if we go beyond the uh, natural arguments to what may be called the prayer proof, the proof in prayer that Allah is not within His creation, the very fact that worshipping uh, objects of Allah's creation is forbidden is proof that Allah is not within His creation. Because if we're He in His creation, then what's wrong with worshipping each other, worshipping the idols, everything else? We have to say this is okay. Why not? But Islam, of course, forbids that. Proof can also be found in the principle of the ascension, the mi'raj. Where Prophet Muhammad goes up into the heavens, to the highest heaven, you know, where the angels could not go beyond, and Allah communicated with him. Allah was ab above him, above his throne. This is all among the evidences. And we can find in the Quran a variety of different verses which speak about things going up to Allah, whether it is the angel and the spirit which ascend to him in a day whose length is like 50,000 years. تَعَرُجُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالْرُوحُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةً Or Allah talks about good sayings going up to him إِلَيْهِ يَصْعَدُ الْكَلِمُ الطَّيِّبُ Or we find Allah describing himself as القاهر For example فَوْقَ عِبَادِي وَهُوَ الْقَاهِرُ فَوْقَ عِبَادِي He is the irresistible above his worshippers Or Allah uses the the, uh, the attribute Al-Ali right? Al-Ali which means the one above which there is nothing you know the highest and Allah describes the believer saying يَخَافُونَ رَبَّهُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِهِمْ those who fear their Lord who is above him but the final evidence because of course some people may bring some other verses from the Quran and we look at them where Allah said that he's closer to you than your jugular vein. And say, hey, what does that mean? We say before looking at that, let's go to the sunnah. We've looked at the Quran, so many verses in the Quran pointing to Allah being above his creation. And we can find in, in Sahih Muslim. In Sahih Muslim, in uh, volume 1, page 306, as well as in Sahih Bukhari, volume 9, page 386. We can find, oh sorry, this is in Sahih Muslim alone, volume 1, page 271. Volume 1, page 271. A hadith by Muawiyah bin al-Hakam, in which he narrates that he had a slave girl who was tending his flock of sheep in a particular lo location called Jawariya. One day he came to check up on his flock and he found that some sheep were missing. So he asked the girl, where are the sheep? She said a wolf came and ran off with them. He got mad, he got upset. So he slapped her in her face, whack, as parents in ignorance do to their children today. People who call themselves Muslims. But he realized when he did this, he had made, committed a grave error. Because Prophet Muhammad had forbade the slapping of or hitting of anything in its face. Not even a dog or a donkey. We're not allowed to hit anything or anybody in its face. And that's why boxing is haram. Boxing is haram. Because it's all about knocking that guy out by punching him in his face right anyway the point is that he realized his wrong so he went to Prophet Muhammad and told him what took place when he did the Prophet became extremely upset 
He, be, he came, you know, red with anger. And so he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Can I free her as penance, atonement for what I've done? The Prophet Sallallahu said, okay, bring her. When he brought her, he asked her two questions. The first question he said to her was, I know Allah. Where is Allah? He could have asked her, do you believe in Allah? But he didn't. He asked her, where is Allah? Why? Because people there believed in Allah. As I mentioned the verse before, if you ask them who created the heavens and earth, they say Allah. But their idea of Allah was confused. They had somehow believing Allah was within the creation and their idols and all these other kind of things. So he wanted to know, did she have the Islamic clarity? So he asked her, Ain Allah, where is Allah? And she said, Fissama, above the heavens. Then he asked her, Waman ana? And who, are, who am I? And she said, Anta Rasulullah, you are the messenger of Allah. So he then turned to Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam and he said to him, A'tiqha fa innaha mu'mina. Free her because she is a true believer. So after that, is there any room for anybody to say otherwise? No. This sunnah is clear. Some people say, when you ask them, where is Allah? Say, you shouldn't be asking this question. Hey, Rasulullah sallam asked this question. Are you telling us we shouldn't ask the question? This is a legitimate question asked by Rasulullah. And the correct answer is above the heavens. And we should teach our children that from the time they're able to speak. Whereas Allah, Allah is above the heavens. The child who grows up understanding that can never be brought to worship Allah's creation. But once you bring a child up believing Allah is everywhere, then it's just a matter of time before somebody tells them, Hey, yeah, Allah is everywhere. He's in me, he's in you, but he's more in me than you. What does that mean? Worship me. That is Sai Baba. More than 8 million people believing he's God, worshipping him. And among them are Muslims. I met Muslims in Sri Lanka and in Trinidad who are followers of Sai Baba. Anyway, if we take that, leave that aside, and we address some other verses, like the one where Allah said, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ And I am closer to him than his jugular vein. I say, okay, what does this mean? We say, it has to be understood in context. Just as if I say to you, Allah said in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الصَّلَاةِ Do not come near prayer. Allah said that in the Quran. Don't come near prayer. Avoid prayer. Altogether. لا تقرب الصلاة What do you say to that? They say, no, you have to finish the verse. You know, Allah said, لا تقرب الصلاة وأنتم سكارى Don't come near prayer when you are in a state of intoxication. فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Cursed are those who pray. You have to complete it. الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ Those who are negligent in their prayer. Those are the ones cursed. Not everybody. So we say the same thing. Go back to your verse. What does it say before that? وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ وَنَعْلَمُ مَا تُوَسُّسُ بِهِ نَفْسُ وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Indeed, I have created humans. And I know what his soul whispers. For I am closer to him than his jugular vein. Allah says, He created humans and he knows what the soul whispers. The soul which is the most intimate part of ourselves. Allah knows whatever that soul whispers. Whatever thoughts we have. Allah knows it. Because he's closer to us 
than his than a jugular veins. So what is he talking about here? His being or his knowledge? His knowledge. As he knows what is in the soul, he knows everything about us because he is closer to us in knowledge than the closest thing we can imagine about ourselves. That is the meaning. And similarly, you know, any of the other verses that you find where Allah describes, for example, him coming between a human being and his heart, you know, or any of you is two, he is the third, you know, if we are three, he's the fourth, etc. These type of verses, when you go and you read the context, it's all talking about Allah's knowledge. So yes, his knowledge, his power, his uh, mercy, it is everywhere in his creation. But not that he, in his essence, is found or to be found in his creation. This is the distinction that has to be made. We'll stop here, inshallah. Um, maybe we'll give about 10 minutes for some questions. Then we take another break. Are we on schedule? Slightly off, but uh, we'll take a few questions. I have a written question here, first and foremost. How can we do da'wah to people who have been caught up in the Naqshbandi Sufi group? They tell people they are on the Quran and Sunnah. Many Muslims from Washington, D.C. area are going to their meetings. Well, we need to educate them to the realities of Tawheed. If they have understood the realities, then they cannot be caught. But if they haven't understood, then the cheap tickets which Snake Nazim is teaching that will take you to paradise the cheap way this will always be popular because human beings are bent towards this if you have a shortcut you know we're always looking for shortcuts so somebody's offering you a shortcut here all you have to do is to be one of my followers as Snake Nazim tells his followers you know if you are his, one of his true followers, when the time of death comes, the angel of death will not take your soul to hand it over to the angels of the next life. He said, I will be there to take your soul and to hand it over to the angels of the next life. And when the angels, Munkir and Nakir, come to ask you the questions in the grave, who is your Lord? What was your religion? Who was the prophet that was sent to you? He says, I will be there to whisper you the, the answers to you. So what is he telling you? You're guaranteed paradise. You become one of his followers, true followers, and you're guaranteed paradise. And of course, people like this. So you find big figures, the ruler of Brunei, one of his followers, built a 25 million pound center for him in England. He's got many followers. It's very attractive. You know? And many who have accepted Islam in, in Europe, in Germany, and in England, you know, they have joined his way. Because, as I said, this is the nature of human beings. Just as in the past, when the Roman Catholic Pope used to prepare what were called the papal indulgences, which was a certificate stating the bearer of this certificate has a place in paradise. You pay some money, he puts your name on the certificate, puts his stamp, and you walk away. Right? This was done for hundreds of years. This is one of the things which Martin Luther protested against. You know, tickets to paradise. People are bent towards this. So, by explaining letting them understand the realities they claim that Snake Nazim is able to be in more than seven locations in the world at the same time so he can be sitting with you here in your dhikr circle and he's also in Sri Lanka he's also in Mecca making tawaf and his, his followers will confirm yeah he's here he's there he's everywhere yeah. so you let people understand that these type of beliefs by understanding the foundation principles of Tawheed they understand that this is some form of deviation 
inshallah, they can extract themselves from this. And the unfortunate thing is that these types of groups that promote this idea, where you follow your sheikh blindly, you don't question. Because as Musa was not able to understand the workings of Khidr, because he had special understanding, as they say, he's able, he was able to see with the spiritual eye. This is one of the statements they like to say, whereas Musa was only looking with, through the material eyes, right? They say in the same way, the Shaykh, he has that connection. Meaning, that if you see the Shaykh go down to the local liquor store, and he buys himself a bottle of Johnny Walker, he comes back, he pours a glass and he drinks it. Don't think that he's drinking alcohol. It may appear that way to you, but no. There is another explanation, a deeper explanation, and they will give it for you. So what that does is it opens up corruption among their followers. So these individuals, himself and his khalifas, they do all kinds of stuff. And the people silently bear these things, believing that there is a deeper explanation. So you'll find the khalifas, like one sister told me from Sri Lanka, how she had you know, gone into this uh, liquor situation with the, their khalifa there. You have in America, the khalifa is, uh, what's his name? Uh, Kabbani, right? Uh, in Sri Lanka, he's left a Khalifa. He's got Khalifas in different locations. And his Khalifa there in, in uh, Sri Lanka, you know, they go through this thing where they, they go in the room, they turn out the lights, you know, and they're remembering Allah in this darkness, and then they turn the lights back on and they find, you know, jewels and stuff like that in their laps and stuff, you know, where this stuff comes from. Anyway, what she was saying that, you know, she had gone to him, she had some problems, and, you know, he was telling her, okay, you make dhikr and so and so. Next thing she knows, he's fondling her. You know? And she's shocked what to do, you know? And he's carrying on and she's just stuck in the situation. She can't say anything. She came out of it, you know, disgusted what to say. And she left the group, you know, ashamed, etc. But basically, she's not the only one. Many of the people have been affected in this way, but they are silent. They don't do anything. They can't say because you cannot judge these things as they appear you know, so in the past you have many examples of this kind of corruption which took place you had people like Jimmy Jones right, who took 900 of his followers down to Guyana and committed suicide together if you read about what Jimmy Jones was doing to his people some incredible stuff you wonder how could people tolerate this well Jimmy Jones had the people believing that he was God he was God so they, everything that he did, they found other explanations for it. Same thing with Sai Baba. You have cases against Sai Baba now where Americans who were among his followers and sent their children to study with him, the males, he molested. He molested them seriously because he, he claims to be celibate, but in fact he is involved in a, a number of homosexual practices. But again, the followers, they don't want to accept this. They want to blank it out. No, no, Sayyid Baba, you don't understand. No, it's not what you see. Not what it seems. They are in the state of denial. Because they've accepted the idea that this man is God. So, these are among the dangers that exist there. As we said, uh, the idea of giving da'wah to the people of this region or of this belief where people are followers of uh, Snake Nazim and others, is to try to give them the foundational beliefs concerning Aqidah. Those who are clear of these beliefs will not fall into this trap. Those who are not are exposed. And I should mention, you know, without getting into a name-calling situation, that Hamza Yusuf, was very popular today, you know, on the uh, lecture circuit, etc. He is a caller to this way. He is a caller. He's an advance. He's amongst the advanced troops. He's out there calling people to this. Now, he does it subtly. Among the subtle ways that he does is, he says, 
everybody has to follow a madhab. And you must follow, get your knowledge from a sheikh. Who got it from a sheikh? Who got it from a sheikh? Who got it from Rasulullah sallallahu And this is his insistence that you must have a silsila, a chain of sheikhs which go right back to Rasulullah sallallahu What you look is historically, those who made this claim are the same Sufis. For their secret knowledge that they have, we ask them, where did the secret knowledge come from? They say, well, you know when Rasulullah sallallahu was in the cave during the Hijra, he hid in the cave from the Quraysh who were hunting him and he was alone with Abu Bakr. There he revealed to Abu Bakr certain secret knowledge. And Abu Bakr told this one, who told that one, who told the other one, who told the other one, who told the other one, who told, one, who told my sheikh. Right? The secret knowledge. You want to learn the secret knowledge? Then you have to make bay'ah. You make your oath of allegiance to the sheikh. You become a murid and you will become privileged to this secret knowledge. Right? This is the claim. And of course, when you look at these chains, you know, this chain of uh, uh, Snake Nazim, you find in the middle of the chain, towards the top, Khidr. Khidr? Yeah. He claims that Khidr was there as one of the narrators of the chain. Of course, this is nonsense. Because they have this belief that Khidr is like Melchizedek, he's still alive. Yeah. This is one of their claims. That Khidr is still alive and amongst us. Yeah. Of course, according to the scholars of hadith, etc., such a chain is inauthentic. It's not authentic at all. And they've fabricated it, in fact. And the Prophet Muhammad said, Taraktukum ala mahajjatin baydah. I have left you on a clear white plain. Leiluha kanara nahariha, whose night is like its day. La yaziru anha illa halik. And anyone who deviates from it is destroyed. The religion is clear. No night and day, it's all one. Now, of course, scholars in looking at verses may be able to give you deeper understandings which than you understood. But once you understand the methodology of how they got that deeper understanding, then you can do it also. It's not hidden knowledge. This is different. Hidden knowledge is like the claim of the Shiites. Right? Who, when they couldn't find any mention of Allah, of Ali, or Fatima, or Hassan and Hussein, who are the key, they couldn't find it anywhere in the Quran, to promote their system of beliefs, what did they say? You know when Allah said in the Quran, Marajal Bahraini al Taqiyan, in Surah Al Rahman, when the two seas come together, they meet. They said, What are the two seas? We say, We know, Allah mentions us when the Quran, the sea, the fresh water, and the salt waters, we know the two seas. They said, No, 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 no. These are not the two seas. The two C's are Ali and Fatma. And you know, after that, Allah says, Minhum al lu'lu wal marjan. What comes from it are the pearl and the coral. We all know the pearl and the coral. No, 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 no. It's not the pearl and the coral you think. It's Hassan and Hussein. Of course, this is hidden knowledge. Because no matter what principle you teach, you cannot deduce this. This is just something coming out of the blue. Because just as they claim that, we could say the two seas are Adam and Eve. And the, curl and the, the pearl and the coral as Cain and Abel. Why not? I could just as well say that. So this is, this is what when we talk about secret knowledge, hidden knowledge, this is how it comes. It is knowledge which you cannot deduce by principles. It's knowledge which only comes from special sources. Right? So, this is not Islam. Islam is clear. It is open. It is understandable. It is, you know, uh, because Allah revealed it for the guidance of humankind, it is clear. Its clarity is without doubt. And we have no hidden knowledge.
Okay, I think actually our time is up. I know there's some other questions just came up. We need to uh, spend a little more time on them. Questions about Wari Sudin and uh, photography being shirk, etc. We can look at those uh, future. I got a note which said, I think this is primary for you all here. Lunch is waiting outside. So I think we better move on that one, right? Subhanakallahum. إن الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed all praise is due to Allah and as such we should praise him seek his help seek refuge in him from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds for whomsoever Allah has guided none can misguide and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray none can guide and I be a witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the last messenger of Allah the top topic which we will be looking at now after completing a look at uh, one of the critical attributes of Allah which relates to Allah's transcendency or being above his creation we're now going to look at uh, another grouping of Allah's attributes and this is in relationship to the question regarding the purpose of creation that this question, why did Allah create me? What is the reason for my existence? You know, why am I here? These kind of questions which people face at different points in their lifetime, they ask themselves these questions and they try to find answers or they put these ideas aside and just carry on with life feeling that there really are no answers to these questions. <clears throat> In Islam we do have an answer and we need to have a look at the, those answers and uh, realize that in the answers to these questions lies the uh, attributes of Allah in their manifestation. Now the question why did Allah create human beings, why are human beings created? If we look into Christianity and Hinduism, the two major uh, scriptures or religions out there, what we find is a lack of clarity. You will not find clear answers to these questions. Uh, we can find statements of philosophers of the past, whether it's Plato, or Aristotle and others, they've tackled these questions and tried to find answers from, for them. But what you find in, in reality is a variety of different answers and even amongst Christians you'll find a variety of different answers and amongst Hindus you'll find a variety of different answers depending on the uh, path of Hinduism one is following etc and how does one know really which is the correct answer you will not find in the scripture clarity you will find interpretations uh, answers are drawn out of interpretations and uh, personal opinions. Whereas when we go into the Islamic texts, you find the kind of clarity which is missing in these other quote-unquote religions. Where Islam begins to look at the concept of why did Allah create human beings, it begins before addressing the issue of the creation of humans by looking first at the reason for Allah's creation. Why did Allah create? Period. Because the creation of human beings is not the greatest aspect of creation. Though human beings tend to think of themselves as being the pinnacle of creation. It is the, we are the greatest of Allah's creation. In fact, the Quran states otherwise. We have a verse in the Quran 
in the 40th chapter, which is Surah Al Ghafir, verse 57, in which Allah said, La khalqu samawati wal ardi akbaru min khalqi nas, walakinna aksara nasi la ya'lamun. Indeed, the creation of the heavens and the earth is greater than the creation of humankind. But most of humankind do not realize it. This is the reality. Allah brings human beings down to size. You know, brings them down from that state of arrogance that they tend to hold that, you know, we are the greatest things out there. No. Allah informs us that the creations of the heavens and the earth is far more complex. It's far more great than the creation of human beings. Therefore, the question we need to address first and foremost is why did Allah create? Period. Now, the answer to this question lies in the attributes of Allah. First and foremost, is the attribute of being the creator. That creation is the natural consequence of being the creator. It is the manifestation of the attribute of being the creator. And if we look in the context, Allah, if you look in the context of uh, human beings, and of course this similitude in our law is beyond this, but on, at least on a human level, if we consider a person who tells you, I am a painter, and you ask that person, well, where are your paintings? Can I see some of your paintings? And he says, well, I don't have any. I, you know, no paintings, but I am a painter. And we ask somebody else, and they say, well, here are my paintings. Obviously, we will consider the one who has paintings this is the painter. Whereas the other one, he's of an inferior quality. He, does he really paint? Do we really, is it really true that he's a painter? You know, the, the, the painting is the manifestation of that quality. And, and it makes that individual greater. I mean, we can look at it in that perspective relative to human beings. Of course, relative to Allah, whether he paints or he doesn't paint, whether he creates or he doesn't create, it doesn't make him lesser or greater. But I'm just saying that ultimately, as the painter paints, the creator creates. Creation is a manifestation of Allah's attribute of being the creator. And what we find in this creation is that a variety of Allah's attributes become manifest. First and foremost, it is the, the one of being the creator. But uh, beyond that, the other attributes of mercy, of grace, of being the all-forgiving, of being the just, the uh, all-knowing, all of these things become manifest in Allah's creation. Now, the well-known Sufi uh, fabricated hadith which states that Allah was a hidden treasure and he wanted to be found so he created human beings as I said it is a well-known fabricated tradition and it is the foundation of this what they call Gnostic approach to religion where it is about knowing Allah, ma'rifah, 